Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Tony Dudzik, Pick Guardian. Rob Chafe, Mad Complication. Wow, two in a row for I'm Rob. I'm number two now. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody, it's me, Tony Dudzik. Welcome to the Guitar Knobs podcast. We're thrilled oh. that you're oh, listening yes, to we are. our show. Uh, where we talk about all kinds of fantastic guitar things. This is just is, is your pals sitting around talking about things that you like to talk about, but we're not really there. But in spirit, we are. Tony, what other things do we do on the show? Well, we talk about uh, making corn cob pipes and. Okay. No, that's and the other the, podcast. Oh, that's yeah. the other. Oh, sorry. No, no we talk about one. boutique gear for the most part. Uh, things like guitars, amps, pedals, yeah. all the good stuff. We, authors, authors. We've had authors. One hundred ones. We've, we've had players. We've had. Well, we've got a special guest today. That's right. Mm-hmm. Special, uh, guest. special guest. Who are you? Uh, yeah, I didn't get. I didn't get the introduction like you guys did, did I? Because well, you're the guest. That's what you do now. You uh, are. Oh, hi, I'm Mark Chatfield. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, there you go. There you go. And I'm special. <laughs> There you are. <laughs> indeed. Yes, indeed. Yeah. We're, we're very uh, excited. And excited. And in honor to have Mark Chatfield on the show tonight, we're going to get mm-hmm. into it. You're like, who's Mark Chatfield? If Who you don't know. Who he is and what he's done. Yeah. Well, you it's will know like, by the end of the show. Yeah. We, we've got a long show to get through all of it. So now, yeah. whether, whether they'll care or not, that's a whole other story. Yeah. But well, <laughs> they don't care about Tony. So it's, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> come on. Then I'm in good company. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Todd usually cuts most of my stuff out yeah, in yeah, and out. Uh, no, but the uh, the theme of today's show is kind of the state, well, the history, the st- current state, and the future of the vintage guitar market. Yeah. And uh, once we get into a little bit, you'll understand why Mark is here. Yeah, maybe just for in fairness sake, uh, if you can do, we're going, we're we're on the we're in the lobby. We're going to go up to the fifth floor. Yes. G- give us a quick rundown of like why Mark. Yes. Well, M- Mark is one of the only people I know that. Uh, has been there from the beginning. The beginning when I'm it, help you out when, with this, when there when there wasn't a vintage guitar market. <laughs> yeah, there it was just the guitar old, market. <laughs> old guitars people <laughs> traded in on new stuff. Yeah, uh, through establishing uh, a, a, a world renowned uh, yeah uh, dealership. I yes. guess you'd call it Is that, that the, guitar at shop the, at the Genesis. As the, it would. The, the Genesis the, the, uh, and the Nexus. Uh, of, the, <laughs> of the vintage. And the decline. The, and, the, and the decline. <laughs> and, uh, and he's still heavily involved yeah. in, the, in, the, in the vintage market, in addition to still playing great and stuff. And boutique. I think it's probably safe to say, you know, all the things that were coming out new back then, it was like he was probably yeah. getting those things first right out the gate. Yep. So uh, we are going to dip into the wild world and wisdom of Mark and uh, his history in rock and roll and in guitars, trading, buying, selling, and whatever else you might have done along the way that to, to get said Well, gear. the things that it, you can speak it was of. All, yeah. It was all legal. Trust yeah. me. All of it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. But... F- First, first, before we dive way deep, deep down into that, do you have any announcements? Tom? I do have an announcement, and this is actually um, a pretty special announcement. A longtime supporter of our show, very longtime supporter of our show, and guest and pedal builder. Mm. This is Doug Christ. Oh yes, Doug Christ. Uh, unfortunately, had to put up a GoFundMe. Oh, no. Because his son is suffering from a, a very severe heart condition. Oh, boy. And uh, he's uh, going to need a, a transplant. Wow. Um, and I, I'm, I know they're in the process of that, but it, it isn't just like, there you go and get out. It, this, is, mm. this is going to take a long time to get him healthy. Uh, so what we are asking, please consider going over to GoFundMe and check out uh, the title is Finding a New Heart for Tim Christ. And this is going to be a big, big help for the Christ family. And Doug is a huge supporter of our community, um, as well as building, you know, uh, 37 effects pedals and just being a really, really solid guy. He's a dad and his son's in trouble and his son's kids are in trouble as a, re- as a result. So let's do what we can to help him out. Um, they're still working towards their goal it's gonna take a, it's gonna take a lift to get it there, but um, uh, I, I think everything that we can do will be highly appreciated. Uh, so that is finding a new heart for Tim Christ. 
go check out GoFundMe and see what you can do. Any little helps. Yep. All right? Thank Absolutely. you to all of our listeners for considering doing that for, for Doug. Uh, Doug, um, I know you're listening, so we're all thinking about you, and we're pulling for you guys, okay? All right, let's move on to what's going on in our music worlds this week. And first, we're going to ta- start off with Tanya Bolonsky, the lovely, the leggy, the what? Oh. Tour gear. No tour gear? Have you listened to the show, man? That's not for a little while yet. That's not for a while. Oh, jeez. Okay. Now I got to clap. Uh. Wait a minute, you just clapped twice for yourself, so... Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to start off with Tanya Bolonsky, the lovely, the leggy, the five-time consecutive uh, champion. There was a break of two years in between. There, there was. Uh, uh, for the... Youngstown um, Kabasa uh, eating contest. queen, yes. <laughs> All right, go ahead. So I just got my copy of uh, Vintage Guitar Magazine, and there's a really cool article in it. They talk about five different uh, amp prototypes or first runs. And, um, you know, they, they cover the Ampeg reverb, pro, uh, jet reverb. They cover the uh, Fender Twin reverb prototype and, of course, a boogie. Um, and, what, you know, I think most people know that, uh, you know, uh, uh, Randall Smith basically started off Mesa Boogie by modifying Princeton reverbs. And um, dropping a 12-inch speaker in them. I did not know that. Oh, you didn't know that. Well, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> Mark, I don't know most of the stuff on here. That's why I started <laughs> It's great having so him around. around. There you go. He's like Ed McMahon. I did not know that. Oh, no, that's Johnny Carson. Yeah. I did yeah, not I know did that. I did not know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh. So, hey, I, that sounded like, sounded like baloney claws. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just heard him today. Um, but anyhow, there's one uh, uh, we were talking a little bit before the what show about that? Bogner. This is uh, uh, Reinhold Bogner's first hand wired. He took a, a an old Super uh, Fender Super amp and basically made a the first version of the uh, of the Ecstasy. That's bizarre looking, and it's just wow. like it's the shell of a of a Fender Super amp. Uh, and this one has a clean channel and, and two dirty channels, which, you know, would be the kind of the hallmark of the, of the, of the Bogner line, mm-hmm. right? So, but even more interesting, this is a totally hand-wired version before, he, you know, they used this and then they, they developed PC boards after that. Uh, so. That's weird, man. It's weird, wacky That's stuff. Weird. But it's, it's a cool article. So if, you know, if you're around, uh. You know, it's the is January. Is that the kingfish, kingfish on the Yeah, on the yeah, it that is. It just came today. I haven't looked at it yeah. yet. <laughs> but it's cool. On page, what Spoiler page alert, Mark. <laughs> if you ever see this Bogner come up. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it, it's funny that you mentioned the boogie thing that I, I know where one of the original one of the original boogies is. Right? Oh, well, really? Carlos Santana owns owns one of them. And my friend Carl Popek, you know him, yeah, in, know in Las Vegas, was working on it not too long ago. Oh, wow. For Carlos, because Carlos lives in Las Vegas. Yeah. And he texted me pictures of it, and he goes, "This might come up for sale." Ooh. And he says, "You know, are you will you broker it or something?" I said, "Damn right, I will." <laughs> <laughs> but I think Carlos decided to keep it. Or, ah. you know. But yeah, it was really pretty cool, pretty cool looking amp. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, I, you, you know what else might come up for sale is there's a Sound City Concord. Ah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a it's a one off. It's a blonde over there. Is, is that brand new sliders on it? <laughs> uh, no, it's all the original. Everything's all completely original. Oh, that's, that's I'm just saying. That, that's, that's wait a minute. That's uh, <laughs> <laughs> funny guy. Uh, all right. Uh, so, so you know, we used, to, we, used to, we used to sell. Well, we'll talk about Lunzars, but we were the Sound City dealer. Oh. Okay, there. so you got. So I'm, I'm, you saw those new. I'm wildly familiar with those. Yeah. Well, we were the Sound City dealer before, up until you remember Swallums. Swallens was, Swallens was on the east side of Columbus. I'm, we're getting, I'm getting way ahead of us here, aren't it, I? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay. Okay. We're, we're, I love okay. this clap thing, man. I'm going to do it all night long. You, you can. I'm, what, no, uh, it's, it's, since you, nobody's sitting really here except for us, but the lights are going on and off every time I do that. No, right. but, uh, um, Swallens was a 
like, do you remember Sun TV? Yeah. Uh-huh. They were kind of like that. They carried everything fr- from appliances to uh-huh. some furniture, and they carried musical instruments. Oh, my God. They carried, they had Gibson there. They had Sound City there. And um, when they closed, they, they didn't last too long, a couple of years maybe. When they when they closed, they were selling brand new Les Paul Deluxes for like $200. Oh, my god! You could buy Sound City 412 cabinets for $60. Oh, I think my. the 410 cabinets were like $40. Well, now that's heads. it's quite a bit more now. Yeah, they are. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, it's like actually, uh, I Actually, uh, a, a guy here in Columbus, though, I think has his Sound City 410 cabinets and 50-watt head from Swallens. Wow. And I think he probably paid 150 bucks for the whole thing. Mm, that's something. probably worth a whole lot more now. It probably, yeah. <laughs> 155 or so. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that was just kind of a cool thing uh, that I found this, well, actually, today. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Very Tony. Cool. Beautiful. Uh, Mark, how about yourself? What's going on in your music world this week? The, the small potato stuff. Well, I got my copy of Vintage Guitar today. <laughs> it came, I got the mail right before I left the house to come here. Well, why don't you give me a call later and we can we read can talk together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I get it on audiobooks anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, what's going on in my life musically? Uh, well, I just got done doing a, a, a God's Show, uh, which is a band that I was in back in the 70s that w- I have reformed. Uh, we with played, a Z, Gods with a Z. With that, a Z. that was the show that you guys went to. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah, yeah at the yeah. King of Clubs uh, night yep. after Thanksgiving. Yeah, and uh, we kind of awesome. we decided to uh, we you know we just put out a new record and stuff, and we started playing a bunch. So we decided to take December off. So basically, I'm I'm not doing much of anything right now except for practicing and nice. and cool. uh, actually building a new pedal board. How much do you practice? Um. Not as much as I should, probably. Uh, I try to pick up a guitar every day. Okay. And I do a lot of noodling in front of the television, things like that. But when I've got, you know, when I'm writing or got a gig coming up, it's a, it's a lot. You yeah. know, mm-hmm. two, three, four hours a day. And, you know, I'm not an eight-hour-a-day guy. My hands hurt now. I'm old. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, it, it depends on, you know, it depends on whether I need to... if you know, go play or something. Yeah. And then I start practicing or if you're learning more, new material, learning new stuff, material yeah. or writing, yeah. you know, when, when we decided to do the new record, um, you know, we had like one song, so I had to come up with, with stuff. And, you know, I, on my uh, iPhones have that little voice memo thing on mm-hmm. them and mine's got like hundreds and hundreds of little ditties that I, if I think of something while I'm sitting there playing guitar, I just turn it on and mm-hmm. I, and I get a thing. If, if nothing else, the iPhone is, that is the greatest oh, contribution great. to guitarists in the yeah. last 20 oh, years. Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah. 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 I used to have one of those little mm-hmm. voice recorders. Yeah. yeah the little, the little micro thing. cassettes, but mm-hmm. two of the, two of the songs on the new record came out of my, you know, out of my voice memo things, yeah. put piece and pieces together and making songs awesome. out of them. So it works. It. Of course, most of them are stupid, but I mean, you know, and and, and then I can't remember how I did something. Now I've gotten smart now. I went, well, this is in drop D and, you know, that kind of thing or open G. And uh, yeah, I have to remind myself that. Nice. Real quick, Mark, what's the new album? Where can you get it at? Let's plug it real quick. Um, Right now it's at, uh, right now you can get it at the gods, G-O-D-Z, USA. Uh, dot com. Um, we're taking the vinyl will be here middle of middle middle to end of January. It's on white vinyl. Cool. Uh, it's nice. on, just on CD right now. The white album. The white al- <laughs> exactly. And um, it will be in some local record stores starting starting this week. It'll be uh, for sure in used kids. Um, I was actually supposed to go over there today and I didn't. Oops. And, uh, I know I'm, I'm the, I'm the distribution center for the, (laughs) actually just for the local. I don't take care of the mail order stuff. Somebody else does. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get some stuff over at, uh, at Kyle's place at Lost Weekend and, and, you know, the local places always seem to want to have it. So yes. Very nice. Right on. Thanks for the plug. Yeah. Uh, Rob. My music week. Um, it involves Todd. Man, you're bl- you're blowing my stuff it's up. Too bad you shouldn't let me go uh, first. That's the way that works. Right. So yeah, I was going to pick up a guitar from Chase Gullet. Uh, I did some work on it, cleaned up some frets, put on a new nut, polished it up a little bit, and I ran into Todd there when I was picking it up. Mm-hmm. So apparently, I I was right. I was feeling that I was being followed, and 
No, Todd's, uh, Todd's nice. there all the time. Oh, I, that's I, yeah, I, yeah, okay. I kind of he's just hiding in the closet. He's got a cot in the back. Oh, yeah. okay. All right, then it's not about me. All right, but yeah, yeah. So yeah, I picked up that guitar. I haven't really been able to play it much, but. Yes, I will have so posted cool. that video by this time. Oh, so the then you will all, all run together. Yeah, so it'll be great. Yeah, yeah so. it all will make sense. Indeed. Um, well, what about you, Todd? As for me, thank you, thank you, Tony. Um, I <laughs> this weekend went to my pal Chase's shop. Oh, really? Wow. I did. <laughs> I did. And uh, you know, we we hang out. We we like to just you know hang out. This it's fun stuff to do, and um, and we do it around some amazing guitars. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, uh, I see Rob sitting here, and I'm like, well, well, well. You know? <laughs> and um, we had a great time because I brought the uh, '50s vibe. So it's '50s vibe, right? Squire, Squire '50s. Vintage vibe, fifties vintage vibe. Sure, that's Something enough. Like that. That's enough stuff to yeah, Google. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, yeah. Tell say it that three times fast. Tell <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's the one that we put the House of Tone pickups in uh, from the UK, who's going to be on the show uh, very soon. Oh, cool. And uh, I said, you know, I just want Chase to hear him because you know he's he's building guitars all day and he's swapping them. People want pickups, and I'm looking for this something special. Yep. And and those ones have a really special quality about him. Um, not better or worse, just different. Just different, yep. And, uh, and, and I mean, they, and I they come in a nice... They are better than the stock ones. I will, I will attest to that. They come in a nice wooden box, too. They come in a fancy wooden box, yes. He, he and could, Tony put in the P90s, which sound really good. Yeah. Uh, so anyways, while we were there, we picked up a couple... Um, uh, of of Chase's crafts that he made. <laughs> well, yep. they're more than crafts. I mean, they're guitars, uh, tellies, and we had some. We put them against some Lawlers. Uh, Lawler fifty two vintage oh, right. it was in one, and then the other one had uh, Brandon. The Brandon Wilm. I don't remember exactly which model it was, but it was his take yeah. on a vintagey. And it was just it was so cool to just hear th- three guitars that look identical or close to it sound so different. Yeah, you and know. even the pickups. We're not talking like you know a T bridge compared to a Strat bridge compared no. to a Humbug. No, they're these all, all these very, are all T bridge, and we even measured the DC resistance of the three, and they were all within one k of each other. Yeah. So it wasn't like it was drastic. really wild. Yeah. It was it was very very interesting. Um, we didn't uh, tear the backs apart too much. Um, we did find out a few things about the electronics, but by and large, it's just you know. They're different breeds, and they and they sounded. They all had their own um, unique benefit that they could lend to a particular yep. sound. And what was interesting is we were talking about writing about you know like if you're writing music or you're, you're playing it, and depending on who else is in your band and everything, you could say, "Man, I can't wait to put these new pickups in," and just be like devastated, like this is not going to sound right in my band. Not bad, just not right. And then, but this one, oh man. You know, so it's it's play around with pickups, people. Yeah, make it feel good. Go down a very deep, dark <laughs> rabbit hole. Oh yes, yeah. Especially on Telecasters, it's so fun to to replace the bridge. Yeah, telecaster. Oh exactly. yeah, that's, yeah. yeah. It's my first. It takes choice a whole afternoon. Yeah. <laughs> Rather just buy another guitar to yeah, swap. Yeah, you're not the just pickup. loosening the strings on that one. No, no, no. <laughs> snap, 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 snap. <laughs> Uh, yes. Well, you know, Todd. Yeah, I do, intimately. How is he these days? <laughs> Very good. Okay. Um, you know what would make a Telecaster sound even better? Uh, yes, I do. What? If it was plugged into a pedal board full of awesome pedals that were hooked up by Tour Gear Design's patch cables. <laughs> Tour Gear Design <laughs> patch cables. <laughs> that was a long road to get there, but we got there. Yeah, yeah. It was. We had many, many steps. Yes, yes. Um, and hopefully your your friends and family have gotten you uh, some some nice things. And if you still need uh, gifts by this time, well, let's see. When this, nope, too late. Mm, I'm you, sorry. <laughs> yeah, just take some of your Christmas money and go get some Tour Gear Design's patch cables. <laughs> You'll have them by the new year. You'll have them by the new year. <laughs> well, we can't guarantee that. But um, there you you're going to have loads and loads of options that everywhere from a three inch cable to a, I believe, a 24 inch cable. And uh, S shaped? S shaped and C shaped. 
<laughs> so you can mix and match and connect all it, the things. It's, Top a, mount, it's a must have, especially for switching out all kinds of different pedals and having fun. You got to have them around. And the cables are flat. They are flat and like a crate. Extremely low profile uh, jacks. So, yes, or uh, plugs. Plugs. Yeah, the jack is the thing. The plug is the other thing. I know. Yeah. I'll get it right one of these days. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know. <laughs> yes. Anyhow, picky, um, picky, picky. I know. Uh, but you know what's even better? I do. The, at, uh, <laughs> at, at, at the car, we're really blown it's, through this. It's, thing. As, yeah, it's as if you can like read my mind. <laughs> it's almost uh, like you guys have done this before. <laughs> when Never, you go to the time. cart, when you go to the cart, you're going to put in the guitar knobs. You're going to save fifteen percent on your order. The guitar knobs, all lowercase, all one word. Yeah, fifteen percent on top that's of a all. Handsome and they're discount, all, and they're already reasonably priced ridiculously reasonably priced. Yes. Was. That's what that should say. Just when you first get yeah. it, it's ridiculously reasonably priced. Just go get some. Anyways, thank you to Tour Gear Designs, Patch Cables, and and Things uh, for sponsoring our four on the floor. We don't have Jared. Rob? Oh, uh, sorry. What was he saying? Let me have a little bit of that, this... <laughs> That's, oh, that's no. usually what he ends up saying. <laughs> yeah. And then See, we have to just, do it a few it's times. It's just like Jerry. Let me get a little bit of this. That's what he does. One, two, one, two, three. Four on the floor. You want to clap? <laughs> that was kind of a win. I like that how it's was, so delicate. That, that was kind <laughs> of a, uh, You spent time in Oxford. <laughs> okay. All right, number one. What's yes. your first? It is a... You know, the Pearl Drum Company made pedals years yes. and years and years ago. I didn't know that. You didn't? No. They made a whole line of pedals. Like how long ago? 70s. Okay. There, there were also Pearl guitars, weren't there? That's a good question. I think there were. I don't know the answer to that question, but I know that they did do pedals. Because? Because I have several. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, and now we're going to get into a really great dishonest story. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, I lied about everything was honest. Anyway, um, or, or legal. So uh, my number one pedal is my secret weapon has been for years and years and years and years worked with almost every amplifier. The only amplifier that I used that it didn't work with was during the era when I was using Lab L11 heads, mm. those solid state heads that the mm -hmm. dude from uh, uh, King's X uses yeah. and uh, Ron, well I did them because Ronnie Montrose you know mm. the, that whole open fire album was done with L11s but anyway mm. didn't work with those because I, I only found one drive pedal that worked with those amps anyway it's a Pearl parametric EQ pedal mm. huh. and it's a two band two band parametric so you can set two different frequencies and it was kind of, I don't want, it wasn't the predecessor because it came out after the, uh, my, the first EQ pedal I ever used was an MXR uh, blue six band mm -hmm. graphic. Mm -hmm. And um, the reason I used that pedal is I, there, were, there was a picture in Rolling Stone magazine, it had to be 1976 or so, that showed Tom Scholes from Boston's pedal board. And that was Basically, before all the Rockman stuff came out, that was more of the secret to his sound. He just pushed the 400 and 800 cycle sliders up on that thing almost to the top. And that's where that, all that mid-rangey, almost wah-wah-y kind of stuff mm -hmm. sounded. So I used one of those in the, in the early gods with a 100-watt Marshall. The problem with those is they didn't have an on and off switch. So they went <laughs> <laughs> all the time. And Dan Abel from Abel Audio was our sound man, but he was also a repairman at the time when he and I met. He was a repairman at Whitey Lunzar's. But um, he, uh, uh, boss, had, I know his MXR had just come out with a noise gate. So he got me a noise gate pedal. So See how they did that? Down. They, yeah, they did they that. They the problem. Like, Don't worry, we've got a solution. Yeah, we'll tell you this. Planned well, obsolescence. And, and <laughs> the, the problem with all the other uh, EQ pedals, see, I told you I, I do long stories. <laughs> That's okay. The problem with all the other EQ pedals that did have it at the time that did have on and off switch before Boss came out with theirs was nobody had an 800 cycle thing like boogie did theirs was 750 most of the other ones were like full octave they had 500 mm -hmm. um so and then it went right up to a thousand i think after that and that 800 was the secret frequency oh. on those things um and then of course you know boss came out with the ge7 after that and there's that had it might have been a ge6 first i don't remember yeah um mm -hmm. and, but it had 800 cycles on it but anyway um i really loved that the eq thing on the uh 
on the lab amps. It, it has an active mid-range EQ on it with a sweepable frequency, and I always loved that thing. So I was in String Shop one day, went down next to the Agora, and I saw those pearl pedals, and I went, you know what? That kind of does the same thing. And uh, and I can't remember who was working then, Tim or Rob Brumfield or somebody. Oh, wow. I said, just, you know, let me borrow. They used to let me borrow stuff because I spent a lot of money down there. And I borrowed the pedal, and and that's the last time they ever uh, saw uh, it. Uh, 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 <laughs> they forgot about it, and I kind of forgot about it. So. <laughs> about six months later, like, didn't we have yeah. one of those EQ pedals here somewhere? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> No, no, it's a parametric EQ. Oh, parametric. Parametric, yeah. I think it's called a PQ7. I Heck, I don't know. Um, the one that I still use is just beat to death. I mean, I've been using it since like 1977 or 78. Oh, wow. Do you just uh, have the one or you got a backup I have, for it? I have a backup. Okay. I have a, a mint one also. There we go. Uh, that I bought. There you go. Yep. That's it. It's a PE10. That's wild. Yep. So and you can actually dial in 800. You can, and, and it boosts. It boot, I mean, you can boost. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it boosts the signal, and it just sounds wonderful with, like, you know, Marshalls, and it sounds great with my – I use Friedman's now, and it sounds mm. great with my Friedman amps. I just love that pedal. And you can, you know, it, it, you can change the frequency to taste, which is, which is kind of nice. I usually don't, but um, – so that's the number one pedal. All right. Nice. Fantastic, and a great story to boot. Yeah, there that's you what, go. That's what we try to do here. That's I know. Now I'm going to get a phone call from Gary Wolf going, you saw Son of a bitch! Give I me, want, you know, yeah. I want my give $50. my forty nine dollars. Yeah. <laughs> they, well, you should look. They made a whole line of stuff, and they they actually made a um, an overdrive pedal that also has uh, a frequency knob on it. That's, that's very cool. Pearl did, and their stuff was really good. The chorus was good. They made wow. a great big delay pedal. And yeah, stuff. No, we and, just had that one up. Yeah, the, the delay one it looked a lot like the Fender. Uh, the Fender units that were out at about the same time. Yeah, probably. The, uh, the silver. Well, the, and this, I mean, this stuff is all, you know, those the good Japanese chips and stuff that they were using, those yeah. or whatever, the 45, whatever, you know. Yeah. You, you, Rob knows all the numbers. I, I don't. It either To me, it either sounds good or it doesn't. <laughs> yeah. you know, it doesn't really matter what, what it says on it. Is. Yeah. yeah. 45, 58, 45, 59, whatever, whatever it takes. It takes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so. Uh, Number two. Yeah, Number two of, will be my TS9 modded by a gentleman named Vaughn Cost, who does not do mods anymore, but he's still around. I, I actually asked somebody on Gear Page one day, I said, is Vaughn Cost still around? And he, he said, yeah, I'm still here. <laughs> he just doesn't do them anymore. He originally did, you know, everybody was doing, doing mods to him, and he did a, a couple of different mods to things. Uh, I actually have two of them. One, uh, one is just kind of the basic mod where they turn it into an 808 and, you know, make it a true bypass and that, that, all that happy crap. But the one that I actually use has um, two extra switches on top that uh, uh, one is a – in the middle, they're both – flat, but one is a 6 dB or 3, 3 dB or 6 dB bass boost, which mm. anybody that uses TS9s knows that they have a big mid-range hump and they take away all your low end. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other one is a compressor. So it's got light compression or a little heavier compressor oh, wow, that's cool. on there. Then it has two extra knobs on the side oh, and an extra foot switch on the top above the other foot switch. Oh my goodness. It has a whole nother <laughs> higher gain TS9 built into that TS9. So you can go between the two and the light changes from green to red. Oh, wow. wow. That's a lot of so, stuff in a TS9 it, package. Uh, you should see it. looks like a little robot, man. It's pretty yeah. damn it's like cool. A science and, experiment. and it takes up space on your board because it's got the two knobs that stick out that stick out next to the jacks. Right, not, right. <laughs> Where you put in the plugs. Yeah. Anyway. Sounds like uh, you need some tour gear design patch cables. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I do. I, I, like, I like those flat – I like the flat cables. Yeah. Um, so those are probably my first two, you know, that, that, that I would – no, as as somebody who's touring and and you know putting your equipment through the ringer, that sounds like a very very specific pedal with an awful lot done to it. 
ha- has it br- has it broken down it ever, or do you worry about that? Or no, I have another one that that he did that that has everything except for the extra knobs and the extra switch. It doesn't have the second TS nine built into it. Got it. And uh, it it actually sounds a little different. Uh, but I've never had to use it. The only thing that's ever happened with this one is the, the pots get dirty every now and then, and I have to spray the stuff out. Other than that, it's been foolproof. You know, oh, that's foolproof. fantastic. Mm, excuse me. Well, you're starting with a good base. I mean, uh, you know, those things are dang near indestructible to begin with. So Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, and the mods even weren't even that expensive back then. I mean, I've had this thing for 25 years or so. Mm-hmm. He did it, and I just, it's a, that's great, amazing. It's a great pedal. How about number three? Number three is going to be the Boss CE5 Chorus Ensemble. Okay. I would. I did not see that one coming. I didn't expect a chorus. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I like chorus. Yeah. Um, but I like subtle chorus. I've tried and owned every chorus pedal known <laughs> to man and probably still own a bunch of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm an effects loop guy. Okay, so, you know, I, I have to run all my time-based stuff through an effects loop because once you do that through a good loop, you just you just can't ever go back to the front of an amplifier. I can't anyway, especially if you play gainy. And, you know, a chorus pedal just turns into a it's flanger. Quite and, different, and, yeah. and delay pedals are useless. They just mush up. If you play clean, it's different. But with, with overdriven sounds, it just doesn't work for me. And so I've had... Well, you've put some loops in some of my. I've put some Quite loops in. I've put some loops in some vintage amps. I shouldn't say <laughs> oh, talk about that. Um, but uh, actually, with with older Marshalls, you know, the older Marshalls that you did, it actually increases the value to put a good loop in those because yeah. people use the loops so much, and we use the uh, what the Metro Zero Metro. Loss yeah. loops in them. Um, but the Friedman amps have, you know, basically that loop in that them. Is so that is already great. built in. So. I've tried every chorus known to man, and I still always go back to that one. Why? Because it has, um, well, it's one of the only pedals that has a level control for it, and it has a depth control both and EQ on it. Mm. So you can can dial, it's the the fourth knob over there is a a concentric for bass bass and treble. And you can make them flat or you can add. Yeah, I don't know if I've ever seen a two-band EQ on a chorus pedal. Yep, see it right there? That's very neat. And it just, it, it doesn't overwhelm. It's just there. That's what I don't like about most choruses. Very, it sounds like it's been put 100% wet even if not, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. And, and like I said, I've experimented with the, the most expensive stuff you can find down to the cheapest stuff you can find. Though a friend of mine is one I've never tried that he's using on his board, and he uses it in the front of his amp. Um, it's an old Washburn one. This the old uh, little the, ugly the plastic black, black Washburn, yeah, and it those. sounds pretty darn good. But I have like five of those. Right. Now, um, I've you, never do had you run one them break. Um, stereo, or do you just run? I it, um, well, that's a hard question to answer. And the the, re- the reason for that is is I don't generally run stereo, but there have been times when I do, mm-hmm. and. The chorus technically will not run stereo. The reason for that is it's not the last thing in my chain. Mm, okay. Yeah. So yeah. I, I make the stereo connection comes out of my delay. So, and what I do is I'll run, you know, I use Friedman Dirty Shirley's. Um, so I'll run one Dirty Shirley and run the loop loop through that. And then I run the return you know, or the, 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 the stereo send from my delay to the, to, the, to the return of the other loops, so I'm just getting the power section of that amplifier. Mm-hmm. You know, I used to do it way different when I was using boogies. Uh, when I was using 50 calibers, I actually ran a mono stereo rig, the the poor man's way. I, I ran a speaker cabinet off uh, off a 50 caliber head in mono, and then I ran two other 412s with a. Uh, I'd take the um, Direct out. direct out into a quad reverb and run chorus and chorus and quad echo reverb. on the quad reverb uh-huh. in stereo and man it sounded huge that was my that was my rosy gig or rig for years yeah. i mean for a long 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 time i had this big rack with 250 caliber heads in it and a simul class 295 the big one yep. big power amp yep. and and a quad reverb <laughs> Which those sound great when they when they're run correctly when they work yeah, yeah when they work <laughs> biggest power supply known to man yeah this thing's huge it's so it's interesting to hear you talk about all of that the old big huge gear and then 
qualify one by saying, you know, the big, huge one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, these were different times. That wasn't even They're the biggest, big hugest huge gear, yeah. you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this, the, back in the day, the small rig, I'm just bringing a half stack. That's, That's the small what I'm saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm only bringing one cab. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, last one, number four. Well, now we're going to the, to the delay pedal. Okay, which is and once again, don't don't laugh. I've tried them all. Um, the the Boss uh, DD twenty Giga delay, or is, I don't think that's called a Giga delay. I think is it, it is a Giga delay. Is it the twenty is the Giga? Yeah, the yeah. the um, two buttons. Yeah, four preset. Yeah, it's got like the two Boss buttons. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah. Um, with yeah. four, well, it's four preset. And it's, a manual. That's the DD20. Yeah, that's the 200, yeah. I think. The 20 is the old one. Yeah. That one. That one. Yeah. Um, you Technically, you get five settings. Yeah, because you get a manual. Because the manual setting is there. And other than having to scroll through the four things. That's why, because I was going to switch to one of those like 15 years ago, and the whole tap, 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 tap. And then I go buy it and be like, damn it. Well, to- <laughs> but 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 here's the, here's the deal. If you want that, they all have to do that unless you buy the um, uh, that TC flashback. It has four buttons, right. and the the line six one does too. But the mm-hmm. line six one, unless you modify it, won't work through an effects loop. They and line six will even tell you that there's a modification yeah. you have to do because they're set up kind of like an old analog pedal, uh, analog delay pedal, and they're not made to be running an effects but loop. You're talking like the don't. old DL4. Yeah, the DL4s. Oh, the new ones that you can, but no, there's all the ones that run through loops or have been modded. Oh, mm-hmm. So, that. but those run great through loop. But mm-hmm. so, my my point being, those have four buttons. Well, actually, three buttons uh, to to get to different delays. But if you're going to use like you know a Strymon, that's even worse to try to try to get all the settings because yeah. you have to scroll through. You only get two. Right. Then you have to hit two buttons at once, and it's a fabulous sounding pedal. Hard to program. Yeah. The, um, the sorry, user, stri- sorry, sorry, Strymon guys. No, <laughs> um, the user interface on the timeline was a nightmare. It, 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 it is, and I've had that and the and the the chorus pedal mm-hmm. and all that, and I just don't want to have to do that. And I, yeah. man, you can you can flip through those four things so easy, it, and it, it takes no time, and you can change everything on the fly with yeah. knobs, and they just never had one break. No, it's but boss. I've got three of them, so yeah. we're, we're all good with that. These things always but, remind but here, me. But here's the funny thing. Well, go ahead. They, they, these things always remind me of the the early um, uh, yeah. like Tecmo Ball, uh, the yeah. football games oh, yeah, in the yeah, basketball. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. The, the oh, early, yeah. early Same handheld case. consoles. Same stuff. casing, yeah. 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 Um, so, so basically, that that's that. But the, the kicker is I'm not using any of those right now. <laughs> That's okay. You don't I, have I, to. I need a different board for something, for something, but yeah, I, yeah, but yeah. I still do have two. I have like, I have four complete pedal boards and, uh, two of them, you know, are set. Yeah, yeah, actually those... when I do God's gigs around here this next year, I'll be using one of those delays and the, uh, it, the, the thing I, I'm using an HX, uh, uh, line six HX effects, not the, not yeah, the not one the with stomp. amp models yeah. and stuff, mm-hmm. uh, not the stomp. Yeah. Um, because you can do six different things, you know, with one in, in each of the boards. Yep. It it all sounds great, but none of the delays sound as good as that. None of the choruses sound mm. as good as that. And yeah. I've been actually thinking about the delays I can deal with, uh, but the chorus I've been thinking about putting my chorus pedal in the loop on that, mm-hmm. you know, and yeah, taking up another another yeah another uh, space on there. But I go back to those things every time, and it still just sounds better better yeah. to me. But the Line Six is a good unit. Yeah, I mean. Hopefully, it will be a good unit. Yeah. Anyway. yeah. Good, good, well, good. Well, that's so. cool. And that, cool. What, what's neat about what uh, these four that you described is you're not going to break the bank. Nope. Getting uh, any of these and backups for them as well. So Not until somebody actually really famous uses one, and yeah. th- then you're done. Or Josh Scott. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <they're, laughs> features it and then gone. There you <laughs> go. Yeah. 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 In yeah and, and as we speak, as you're listening to this, this one is 140 bucks. On on reverb right now, and I bet there's a, a couple that are probably cheaper. You can than that. you can find those for a hundred dollars, yeah, yeah. especially if they don't have a power supply with them, and yeah. and and they will run. They'll they'll run off off just one Battery. you know one one uh, yeah. output of the Nine power volt, supply. Yeah. Unlike the unlike the Strymon yeah. stuff. Yeah, these use batteries. You know what? I think there is a battery. That, that I think it takes like six double A's or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's got this big yeah. battery compartment on the back yeah. of it. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's that's super cool. We always love and and what did we get? We got four 
Are those, those four that have never been, been on, on here before? Really? No. Okay. <laughs> so after do Mark after doing this for right, where are we going eight eight years now? About that sixteen two thousand sixteen. Do the math. Seven. Su- Superhead. Almost Wonder Brain. like seven. Give years. me two pronouns. Who me? Uh, anyways. Who me? Okay. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> the little Benny Hill thing. Anyways, um, the point being that after you know three hundred plus interviews asking that same question. We always get new setups, new pedals, new things that people are like, I can't live without this. And we're like, really? Why? Yeah. And so that's always a fascinating thing on the show. So thank yeah. you for doing that. We appreciate it. Yes. I'm going to hand over the, I'm going to take the steering wheel like in a, in a good <laughs> funny movie and just give it to Tony. <laughs> well, okay. So uh, this is a, for all of our listeners, I mean, we have, may have some local folks. Um, but uh, they may not be aware of who Mark Chatfield is. Well, Mark Chatfield, as we talked about a little bit earlier, is, I would say, one of Columbus's premier guitar players. I mean, that, that goes without saying. The uh, toured nationally with the gods back in the, starting in the 70s? Yeah, 70, the band formed in 76. Uh, first album came out in 78. Okay. Um, and then we broke up in late 79. <laughs> that was quick. <laughs> it, it, when you think about all the stuff we did in that, that three-year timeline yeah. is insane. Just yeah. insane. I mean, I could go through it all with you here, but, you know, yeah. nobody cares. So I won't, you know, I won't Somebody do it. cares. Well, I mean, we, we, went through, we went through forming the band, being a bar band, you know, doing goofy-ass cover songs. I mean, we did some goofy stuff. Um to losing two members in a car accident, uh, mm. um, to coming back, hiring another guitar player, being a bar band, you know, playing smaller places, to being a local band that sells out the Agora literally overnight. We that happened, getting a record deal, doing an album, doing two na- whoop, doing two national tours, doing the second album, doing another national tour, and then breaking up. All in three, all in a three-year wow. period. That's a wild ride, so, man. Yeah, yeah. So. That's that. That's very compressed. <laughs> yeah. And um, after that, uh, one of the local regional band, Rosie. Yeah, Rosie. Rosie spawned from the gods. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Eric. Eric Moore. Eric Moore didn't. Nobody used the gods when the, when we first broke up. Yeah, uh, he was the Eric Moore band. Okay, and then um, I I was Rosie actually started out being a being Streetheart. That was the first name of the the band. That's a good name. I like well, that name. I I got it out of. Uh, remember those uh, record record price guides that they used to have? Where they're kind of like those price guides. Yeah. It was a bo- the name of a. I happened on it by accident. Uh, the name of a Bobby Darren album was called Streetheart. Mm. <laughs> I went, man, that's a really great name for a band. Yeah. So I took it and then. Uh, a friend of mine lives in Indianapolis. It's a booking agent. He goes, you know, there's already a band called Street Art out of Canada. And no, I went, great. And it, and and uh, it was the guy from. Um, the, <laughs> Sorry, the... you can't use that name. Yeah. <laughs> well, they. I think they'd broken up by then. I think because the guitar player, the guitar player that was in the band, was the guitar player for Loverboy, Paul, whatever. Mm. They had that Kramer. Yeah, oh, Kramer model after yeah. him, whatever his name was. Yeah. But yeah, that was his band. So we changed it to uh, changed the name to Rosie, and there's a story behind that that wow. you don't want to hear. Years are we talking about? We're in the, uh, in the 80s now. Well, yeah, no, so. well, yeah, no, yeah, late 79 was when Rosie first started. You yeah. Know, 79, 80, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I, you toured with Bob Seeger for how many years? Well, I still do. Well, so, okay, yeah. Um, yeah, that, that kind of happened. Uh, that that's That's kind of a... <laughs> I love it. Do we let, me, let me think do about that. Let me think about this for a second. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I love how uh, how quiet you do. He'll never okay. see the little blip. Okay, so that's why I always. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Okay. Um, th- that's how th- there's a there's a, a a Grand Funk Association with this band, and that's because Don Brewer from Grand Funk. Uh, produced the first Gods album. And Uh, we actually recorded it at the Swamp, which was Grand Funk Studio up mm -hmm. in Michigan. So I met Don. uh, I met Don during that period. And then Grand Funk broke up and they did a, a band called Flint with everybody from the band, except for Mark Farner. And I went up and played on that, played on that record. And, um, so after that, Don and I kind of lost touch, but I'd met uh, Mel Shocker, the bass player, and Craig Frost 
uh, the keyboard player for Grand Funk and I became lifelong brothers for, you know, just like that. One of those things where you just hit it off and we're still great friends. So um, December of 19... 19- 1982. God, if you people knew how much I drank and did drugs during these years, and I can remember this stuff, you still remember this. You would be amazed. Um, Anyway, uh, so December of 1982, I'm laying in bed, and my phone rings early in the morning, and I answer, and it goes, "Hey, it's Don Brewer. You want to come up and audition for Bob Seger?" And I went, what? (laughs) So I said, sure. So I went up and auditioned for Bob Seger. He um, Craig Frost had joined Bob Seger in late 79 after Flint broke up um, as a keyboard player. And then uh, in 82, uh, their, their drummer quit. David Teagarden left the band and Drew Abbott, Bob's guitar player for years and years, also left the band. So they needed to replace two guys. So Brewer came in to play drums. And then they were just auditioning hundreds of guitar players and mm. uh, they those guys both suggested me and I went up and basically got the gig. That's cool. cool. Awesome. Now at that point in time um you know for the younger audiences Bob Seger would have had what would have been hot right about that time. Um there was a brand new album out then called The Distance and uh the the big song the the, the 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 I think the hit single on that was a song called "Roll Me Away," which he still opens with that song. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what the album was before that. The the I think the the album before that was maybe the second live album, which was called Nine Tonight," which has all the hits on. You know, has got you know. Uh, old time rock and roll and main street and turn the page and you know all that mm-hmm. all that kind of yeah. stuff like that um and then the distance came out then the album the next album is the one that had like a rock on it right oh, so yeah. so you're probably like a ton of fun to travel with because then you're listening to radio and they're like hey dr- 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 change. the song comes out. i played on that yeah i played that <laughs> i did that i was on that one <laughs> yeah with, with him with, with him with me not so much he uses almost all studio guys oh, and a lot of the band i mean like old time rock and roll isn't hardly anybody from this there's a couple of seeger guys on there but the guitar so solo on there is some guy that just showed up at Muscle Shoals, came in and played the solo, and then they never saw the guy again. It's a, <laughs> the weirdest story. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I'm on, I am on some Seeger stuff. I'm on the Like a Rock album. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, then I'm on a, a live single, uh, and uh, which is a Fortunate Son, which is a Creedence Clearwater mm. song, and then the the new album. I'm, I we, we I recorded a bunch with him down at Ocean Way in Nashville in 1999, and most of that stuff got shelved uh, mm-hmm. for for a long long time. Then the brand new album that came out, I think in 2019 when we were out on tour, I actually play on three songs on that from those sessions and co-wrote one of the songs cool. on that. So, yeah, I got like, you know, I got like a, a, a $60 royalty check. <laughs> nice. Like, you know, wow. yeah. That's from 2 million yeah. Spotify plays. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, well, that's cool. cool. Nice. So that's, I mean, that's one side of That's one of side Mark. of Mark. Yeah. Now, yeah. you've also been involved with... Uh, We'll call it vintage guitars. Back in the old days, as we said earlier, those are the, the old guitars that everyone was trading in on them brand new Fenders. <laughs> yeah, so this is his music retail, like yeah. where he started yeah. working retail. That's uh, when I when I got out of high school. Um, when I graduated from high school, uh, I started working at a, a. I was a screen printer, a, a silk screen printer, a T-shirt guy. So you had to ship the stuff. Some of it went UPS. Some of it went truck. Some of it went Greyhound. So when people used to ship stuff through Greyhound. Wow, wow. how about that? So I would be the guy that had to take the van down and drop the stuff off at Greyhound. Well, when I would do that, I'd stop at Whitey Lunzar's down on Main Street and just kind of hang out with those guys. And every now and then, I we had a we had a misprint shop there. So anything that had a little piece of ink on it or got screwed up went in the misprint shop, and they sold it for like a dollar. And um, and you know, if you were if you were smart and you were printing, and you there was a shirt that you wanted, you'd do a misprint <laughs> on it so you get one of the shirts. <laughs> so, uh, there it is. <laughs> Oops. So I would uh, you know I'd I'd like accumulate a bag of of misprints and take them down there and give them to the guys down there. And they thought that was just the coolest thing. And then one day they offered me a job. 
oh. down there. And I actually started out in the guitar repair department uh, downstairs with a guy named Harry Phillips. And they soon figured out that I, I knew a lot about equipment because I'm one of those guys that, you know, when I was a kid, I had every catalog known to man. I'd send off for every manufacturer's catalog. I'd put the pictures on my wall. Mm -hmm. You know, the minute I got anything brand new, I take it apart. <laughs> then I ended up in the uh, then I ended up in the in the sales department working with Ed Whitney. Ed Whitney down there, oh, and uh, and a guy named Dino Bradley who really got me started in this in the in the vintage guitar. Right into that. Yeah. Oh, so, absolutely. So what was the the I don't know you wouldn't really call it a vintage market but the retail market at the, uh, of the time. But there I mean there was a kind of vintage I mean we all kind of knew especially with through Dino um, we all kind of knew that that the older stuff was cooler. You know, but it went for less money than new stuff. Right. You know, at that point, I I had amassed a uh, when when I left Lunzars and um, and started the Gods with with Eric and Glenn, I had I had six Les Paul Juniors at that point Jeez. that I'd not paid more than eighty bucks a piece for. Oh. You know, um, the, the the stuff that used to walk into Lunzars there was just insane. You know that that just that kind of stuff. But there were some guys like uh, Bob Hughes. Mm -hmm. Um, he was always like a, a guitar collector, you know, he had a no caster, he had a 60 sunburst, Les Paul, stuff like that. So we all kind of knew the stuff was cool. And that's when we could still go down to uncle Sam's, you know, and pull a 50 strat off the wall for 250 bucks, you know? Um, and, yeah. but, but that's what the stuff was going through. My main guitar at the, in the beginning of the gods was one of the 1967 flying V's, the Sunburst mm. flying V's. I own two, the two consecutive serial numbers, zero, 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 two, Whoa. nine, five and zero, 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 two, nine, six <laughs> and two, nine, five. I broke two, nine, five. I broke the headstock on two, nine, five. Oh. And I have no idea where either of them are at this point in time, but they wow. were both Sunburst, uh, 67 long headstock flying V's. Wow. That's wow. wild. And, and the trade value on those is about 200. 250 bucks <laughs> yeah. at that point in time you know yeah that's i mean my experience now it really it was more late 70s into the 80s up in youngstown we had a store called Ducey music mm -hmm. and it was the same thing you know you, you could bring stuff in and i everybody was looking at all the new stuff that was hanging up there i was going in the back hall yeah. where they had all the junk trade-ins and yeah. things like that and the stuff that i found there was just incredible what's here right? here's a real quick older guitar store for, for you from Lunzars. I told people about this guitar for decades and decades and decades, and I'm going to name drop here, okay? So mm -hmm. um, this guy this guy named Bruce Kirshner uh, was working with Harry downstairs, a guy from New York, working with Harry downstairs, and I got a, it was a 58 uh, single cutaway Les Paul special in Les Paul Jr. Sunburst. Mm which everybody's going, yeah, right, you know. I know there's some cherry ones, and I think there's a black one or a couple, and but nobody had ever seen a sunburst one. And uh, I sold it to him for like, I don't know, 200, 250 bucks, something like that. And then he probably took mm. it back to New York. And I've been telling people about this guitar since 1975 or 74, and never, never see one. Brian Ray from Paul McCartney's band uh, posts stuff all the time on Facebook, he posted uh, a, a, a Sunburst. He also has a Junior Sunburst SG Junior, oh, which wow. is cool as hell. But I wonder, was that featured on the Gibson, uh, the Gibson Stories? Um, it might have been. I don't know. He's, it, it, he's in like Palm Springs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he, they, he, you, if you haven't seen it, okay. Um, the uh, the Gibson the Gibson Stories. I can't remember. It's like Stories or something like that. Um, uh, they they will sit down with, you know storied players and and go through a bunch of their Good collection yeah. mm -hmm. and and he brought out some doozies he's so. got some he's got some really really odd really yeah. cool stuff but i actually sent him a really big long message telling him the story about i'm so glad you have this i've been telling people the story <laughs> about existed. this guitar forever and ever <laughs> and ever is there's only one we don't know i mean oh. nobody's sure there might be more than one but yeah. that's the only time anybody's ever seen one and wow. that that guitar ended up was in columbus ohio there's a lot of stuff that came out of columbus and cleveland and akron you know yeah. this was a and you know michigan of course it was a hotbed for the for all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There's a lot of dealers down here. You yeah. know, there was Whitey, Whitey Lunzar had a chain of stores. And of course there were coils that had a chain of stores. Mm -hmm. 
most of the really, really cool old guitars, we can get in the Explorer, the Korean Explorer stories if you want, came out of Summers and Son. I've, I've owned, I've had two, uh, two 58 Karina Vs, and they both came from Summers and Son no here. Because they still have, both had Summers and Son stickers on the, on the cases. Wow. Yeah. You so, said yeah. had. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, two walked, yeah. Into, two walked into Cowtown Guitars within six months of each other. Wow. And the, the second one is, is a really super clean one that a guy named um, Perry, Mar, uh, Perry Margar, Margoloff owns now. And it was actually in, on display in, um, in, in the, um, oh, what, what's, that, what's that museum? MoMA, in the Museum oh, of Modern wow. Arts. They did that Play It Loud uh, yeah. thing there. And Rob McNally and I went to it when we were on tour. We had a day off and went to that. And there was that Explorer in there. Wow. And, and I knew it was that one, first off, because it said it was owned by Perry. And there, one of the tuning buttons was changed. Because mm. when these ladies, these two old ladies brought the guitar into the shop, had a picture of their dad playing it in church, sitting down playing this. <laughs> Just school. playing the Korean <laughs> in church. And I pull it out, and it's got flat wound strings on it. You know, the actions, I'm, for those that can't see, it's about an inch high. Action about the inch high, and, and, and it's tuned up to pitch. I'm going, we can't do this. I turn one of the things and one of the tuner Correct. buttons oh. just broke off. And they started laughing and I almost peed my pants. <laughs> <laughs> they I, had I no mean, idea. I, I, I'm going, oh, no, oh, please, no. No, I had to go home and call my therapist. It was that yeah. bad. That, that's a true story. I had to. Um, so, yeah, uh, a, just a lot of cool. There was, um, there was a store down from them and it probably weren't, maybe one of the same guitars, but... Uh, there's the you know where the Atlas building is down there. I think that's on Gay Street. Um, uh, down there. Yes, it's got those big pillars in front of it. There used to be two stores there. One was called um, Guitar City, and one was was called Levinson's, which is now Lev's Pawn Shop. Mm -hmm. right. They were both pawn shops. But Guitar City, Guitar City was owned by the Plotniks. This family called the Plot named the Plotniks, and it was basically a pawn shop. I mean, wall of guitars as far as the eyes can see. Mm. And I can remember to this day, and I know people uh, people that I know here back me up on this. It's not just my imagination that I saw it. But there was a Karina V and a Karina Explorer up there, and they were just you know weird-shaped guitars to us back then, but they just sat up on that wall for years. Wow. We'd take the bus down from Grove City when I was like 12, 13 years old and you know go hang out at Lazar's and go down to all the stores. And we'd go into Guitar City, and this old guy with a smelly cigar would go, you're buy anything and we go we're just looking get out you know you just throw us out so yeah. but <laughs> so, so it started at whitey's whitey's right out of high started school at and, and then, then how long were you there well let me get back to whitey's for okay. a little bit there was at that point in time columbus's very first vintage guitar store mm -hmm. used in vintage guitar store it was called the jolly gargoyle Oh. And it was up on Fifth Avenue. Uh, the, the, I think the, it's a, it, an old house that was a, a, a antique store for a while called the Jolly Gargoyle. Gargoyle. Um, two guys, Bob Gage and Mike Blatz. You guys might not know Bob, but you might know Mike. He was the guitar player in the Burners for a long, long, long okay. time. Mickey Blue is what uh, the name he went by. Great okay. guitar player, and he actually did one of the one of the Bo Diddley gigs I played. He he was the other guitar player in that. Really great guy. Mm -hmm. um, who passed away a few years ago, but, uh, they, that's where they, they actually started doing that in 19, that had to be 75. They actually had, there actually was a vintage guitar store hmm. here in 1975. And that's all that they were just focusing on. Yeah. Used and I mean, even the vintage stuff, it was just used basically vintage, used. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Pretty much. That's yeah. where I bought my, my, uh, main Marshall head that I used in the gods. I think I paid 200 bucks for it, mm. you know, from wow. them. And, uh, you know, a lot of stuff, we, you know, we bought and sold and traded, you know, out of there for, for quite a while. Then, then Michael ended up with quite a, quite, quite a collection, you know, over the years. And, uh, I own some of that stuff now after he passed away, I bought a bunch of it from his daughter mm. and, uh, some, some cool pieces in there that are mm. now my cool pieces. Mm. One, one that one piece that, that he got that Steve Donnellan, do you know, Steve, yeah. Steve got from me that he sold to, to 
that he's, I think he sold it to Mike Blatz, and now I have it again. <laughs> it's a, a All fi- comes round. full circle. 59 Rickenbacker Capri. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yes. Unfortunately, it's been in a flood yeah. in the basement. And, yeah, I heard uh, about the condition on that one. Yeah, I own it. It's in my basement, and, and there's, there's this, well, it, the finish flaked off. And it's the case is just full of these little, you know, long strips of finish, finish in yeah. there. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, fin- I mean, the knobs are seized; they won't oh, even yeah. turn. Those are but all the parts are there and stuff, and it's a really cool looking guitar. Oh, yeah. it's more of a piece of art, probably, than you know, yeah. th- than it is uh, than it is a functional instrument. But, yeah. Uh, anyway, so so, so after yeah. Whitey's, you uh, did a stint at uh, Columbus Music. Is that that right? was the many, 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 oh, many. Oh, that was yeah, many decades. Was that, after that? Oh, okay. Really? I so, that so, was... so after Whitey's, you didn't do retail for? Oh no, no, no. At Whitey's, I was, um, uh, I was playing with Ed mm-hmm. in, in Borrowed Time, and uh, there was a, a really big bar band around here called um, uh, uh, Sky King. <laughs> Did I do that right? Yeah, you're doing great. Okay, great. You should do, yeah, you they can... were called Sky King, and uh, I had a girl singer named Diane Bassick, and uh, uh, a good uh, keyboard player named Don Groner. The bass player was Eric Moore, the drummer was Glenn Catiline, and the guitar player was Bob Hill. Bob and Eric had been in the Capital City Rockets, which was a Columbus band that got signed. They were on Electra Records. They have an album out on Electra Records. Um, good band. Uh, the singer was, uh, Jamie Lyons, who was, uh, actually from the music explosion. He sang a little bit of soul. Oh, wow. Da, 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 <laughs> da, 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 da. Yeah. Jamie was in that band anyway. So anyway, they have this band and Eric wants to not do covers anymore. wants to do a, a, uh, you know, an original band. And they'd heard, I became friends with them because I used to go see them at the Sugar Shack all the time. And then they'd come down to the music store sometimes. And they heard me play down there one day. And uh, Glenn and Eric asked me if I wanted to, you know, let's, let's play a little bit and see. So we had rehearsal ho- studios down in the basement of Lunzar's. So we just went down there and, and jammed, uh, the word jammed, mm-hmm. um, a couple of times. And, they said, you know, we're going to do this band and we're going to call it the gods. Do you want to be part of it? And so the three of us were that was the original band. Oh, wow. And then we hired uh, Mike and Hayward, Mike, Mike uh, Adams and Hayward Law from a band called Kingsley Fink um, out of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And the original gods had two drummers, <laughs> uh, Mike, Mike uh, or um, Glenn Catiline and, and Hayward Law. We had two full drum sets on stage hmm. and had two drummers. And Mike and Hayward got killed in a car accident. Uh. And uh, on their way to Parkersburg to pick up our promo packs that we had purchased. Mm. So um, then they they decided we'd hire Bob Hill and not have two drummers, and that's how that's that's what the album version, you know, and the and the big draw version of the Gods. Right. And it literally went from, you know, playing the putting up our own posters for the Agora and stuff, you know, on the down there on the on the the uh, light poles and stuff. Mm-hmm. And it went from 100 people to selling the place out in a very, very short period of time. But we had a lot of support from the record or from the radio stations. And then that 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 came to us. Uh, we got that that band got signed to a record deal without ever entering the studio. We got signed mm-hmm. on live performance. Hmm. And uh, so that's what I did in, in that amount of time. I, I didn't I didn't you know from 19. Uh, from the time I left Lunzar's until I'm going to say 1986 or 87, you know, all I did was play music for a Playing living. Full time. Wow. Yeah. And then Not I went bad. through a, went through a, 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 a divorce and uh, and you know had some other uh, some other bad habits at the point, and I I was broke and uh, had to get a job, <laughs> so I worked at this oak. And that's how you here comes Columbus music. Here comes yeah. Columbus music, and that was even an accident. Really? Yeah. I um, and I knew some of the people in there, so I just sat around talking and shooting the breeze with them. And I said, you know, if you guys need some help, you know, putting some of this stuff up, I'll. I got nothing else to do right now, so I started assembling drum sets for them, and um, and one thing led to another, and I started working there. And that, nice. was, that was pretty much it. Okay. And then it went, went from that location to... The, the Morse Road Morse location. Road location. Then I moved to California for a little bit with the uh, reformation of the gods. Okay. 
And where uh, about? Huh? I'm from California. Where would you? Where'd oh, you live I li- lived in Los Angeles. I lived at okay. um, uh, the apartment I lived in was on a street called Lanewood, which was between Orange and La Brea, um, yeah. uh, right next to Hollywood High, basically. And then before I moved out of there, I lived on a, I lived in a Venice Beach on uh, Elk. Elk Grove, I think nice. it was the street. Cool. So um, we moved out there and, and we're trying to get a record deal again and that didn't pan out. So I, I came back and I didn't want to go back to Columbus Music. So I just decided to open my own my own store called <laughs> Cowtown Guitars. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so many people might recognize the name Cowtown Guitars from Pawn Stars. Yes. When you, after you started here in Columbus... Moved operations to Las Vegas. Las Vegas, yeah. And what year did you open in Columbus to kind of give some 92 people or 93, so somewhere 92, around 92, 93, there. yeah. And then I moved to, I moved, we actually had two stores open at one mm-hmm. point. Um, we opened the, I opened the store in Las Vegas in 97. By that time, I think people were starting to yeah, call it vintage, vintage guitars. Oh, yeah. yeah. So how had that changed? I'm sure, you know, price wise things changed, but in terms of what people were after. Um, price wise, yeah, price wise things changed, but we're still, you know, I look at some of our original ads and, mm-hmm. you know, and, uh, the guys from vintage guitar, uh, Alan gave me a copy of the Alan green, Greenwood uh, gave me a copy of the first, uh, thing that we did there. And the prices on some of this stuff yeah. is just silly. Well, I was gonna say early nineties, mid nineties, you, 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 stuff was still affordable. I remember going to guitar shows and being able to buy, you know, 50 watt 800 for 500 bucks. Well, and, and here's, here's the funny thing. I, you know, I just, when we opened the store, that's when I first started doing it. I actually did one guitar show before I opened the store. And it's when they did the first guitar shows here were like at the, at, at a hotel out on, on Hamilton road. Wherever okay. they were then, it's better than they are now. That place <laughs> oh, sucks. It's terrible. Yeah, yeah. I, I kind of miss the, the, you know, the shrine. Shrine was, the, but oh, yeah. they, they, there were two other places before that. One was a big gymnasium, and then the, uh, the other one was literally in the hotel. You know, and they mm-hmm. sat up. You know, like they do trade shows kind right. of things. Um, but other than that, I, I, you know, I hadn't really, really gotten into, you know, doing, going around doing all the shows. But I started making friends with a lot of the dealers, you know, uh, they'd come into Columbus because nobody here knew what anything was worth. Mm. And they thought it was a, they, they would laugh, you know, they'd bring, you know, $50,000, which then was a, was a, a fortune, you know, and they, Gil wouldn't, would, would not have enough room in his van to put anything. You know, I, I remember, I remember Buck Salser, uh, coming up to me, at my booth at the one show in the gymnasium and he brings in, brings up this like 1960, 61 Les Paul SG and just immaculate condition. He goes, man, I just bought this at the front door for 150 bucks. He goes, he goes, the pickups in this oh are worth God. 300 a piece. And you know, yeah, <laughs> yeah. PAS for 300 yeah. a piece. Uh, yeah, that's good. And, uh, but that, that was it. People here did not I mean, and I'm sure it wasn't just this market. There were probably yeah, other secondary probably hadn't markets. The, yeah, the places like yeah. this. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, everybody here knows well, or thinks they know. Well, and we've talked about that with the internet. I mean, I saw the guitar oh, yeah. shows from the mid '90s to well, 2000 change like drastically. Oh, yeah. Well, and you know, and some some really bad things happened in in there. And all these pre-2008 things happened. I'm, I'm not going to name anybody here because a couple of them are, are my friends. But th- there were some people that used to go out to the guitar shows with basically uh, ba- basically a, an open checkbook to spend whatever they wanted. And they'd just buy all this stuff up for retail. Then they'd take it back to said places and put a new retail on it mm-hmm. at 20 or 30 percent higher. They still are doing that. Well, well, to a point, they do, yeah. yes. Um, the problem with that is then everybody else follows suit, you know. Mm-hmm. And then 2008 – hit mm-hmm. you know and i know guys that still have stuff that they've bought in 2007 at, at ridiculous prices that that, that they Never still recovered. can't know but n- no but just for reference in 2008 uh obviously i think you're referencing like where everybody Recession. lost their the money. crash yeah i yeah, mean yeah. everything crashed yeah. it wasn't just guitars it was every no, everything. everything crashed yeah. um the the 
and and even at that point, a lot of people didn't realize it, 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 it didn't realize that stuff would finally. Everybody's going, yeah, stuff's never going to be that expensive again. It's not going to happen. And some stuff hasn't recovered completely, but other things, like for example, Les Paul Juniors are yeah. are yeah. insane. I mean, the prices on this stuff yeah. is insane. Um, they. Uh, uh, it, well, once again, some stuff recovered, some stuff did not recover. It's it's kind of like I was talking to uh, uh, Elliot Michaels down at, at Rumble Seat, and it, it, when I was down there during the pandemic, because I sold somebody, I sold a famous person a guitar down there, and instead of shipping it, I just put it on a got on an airplane on Southwest. I'll let you put a guitar in the overhead. Mm-hmm. So I just I just flew. To, I actually flew down in the morning. Went to Rumble Seat, hung out, delivered the guitar, and then flew back that night. Had dinner with some friends that I play with down there and, uh, and cool. flew back that night. But um, we were talking about the pandemic and how we, he and I and a bunch of people thought that, man, it's going to be like, like prime, you know, prime pickings here. Everything's going to come out. It's going to be really cheap. We're going to buy it. And the exact opposite happened. I was mm-hmm. blown and, away when that and, happened. And that's why the prices are what they are. I mean, there was a point in time where you couldn't find stuff. Yeah. I mean, nothing, you know, uh, oh, yeah. you know, one day there's, there's a thousand pre CBS strats for sale. The next day there's none, yeah. you know, yeah. it was just insane. Now, when, when was the, the big Japanese buying boom? That yeah. was, that was in the, that was in the late eighties into the, into the early nineties, yeah. you know, they'd come around to all the, that's when I really started doing get you know, more guitar shows, Texas, you know, and all that all that stuff like that. And they would just come and, you know, they, they'd just have several tables with nothing there. Yep. And by the end of the night, you know, DHL, by the end of the Sunday, DHL's pulling their van in there because they've got, you know, 900 guitars that yeah. they, that they bought there. And everybody used to sell, you know, everybody used to sell to the Japanese at that yeah. point in time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there's time. been top dollar. Yeah, and there's, oh yeah. There's been kind of a reversal on that since their economy has tanked. The, yeah. The yeah. You more. can buy a guitar over there almost as cheap as you can here. And, and I know some dealers that have gone over there and bought mass, you know, bought, you know, 30, 40, 50 guitars from, from some of the dealers well, over there. Well, talking about, you know, yeah. change in things, you know, uh, guitar shows, when I was coming up, I, you, if you want a cool piece of gear, you had one or two local sh- stores and then you had to wait for the guitar show to come in town. Right. This was before internet was a thing. And then over, you know, my early 20s internet boom so okay now if i want an old vintage marshall i can just go online and find one now right, right. i'm noticing kind of with japanese guitar stuff i'm seeing a lot of japanese dealers it's interesting that they were the ones or not them directly but japanese dealers were buying these up pre-internet and now i'm seeing them dump them yep post the internet so sometimes i'm like why is this so cheap and it's out of japan i'm like that's just cheap and it's a reputable dealer but the, their stuff's know. all over ebay and, and yeah and ebay and 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 uh and i see a reverb lot on too. reverb yeah, yeah a yeah. lot yep yeah. yep yeah. and and you know what's what's happened with some of the stuff is the people that that used to buy you know are like my age a little older than me some a few younger and the younger generation isn't near as interested in all that stuff as as we were. Mm-hmm. That's why you'll see a lot of guys, especially guys my age, even even you know guys that are famous and stuff. You'll see so and so's collection is up for sale now because mm-hmm. time to sell is the time to sell is now. You're almost you know you're in your seventies or eighties or so. Just dumped a- Honest stuff. See, and I mean, why keep it now? What yeah. are you going to do with it? You know, yeah. and it's you, you lose interest, and uh, and and you're probably making a lot of money on your stuff right now because it is peaking again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now, whether it'll dump again, I have no man. I have, I wish I could predict that stuff, but yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, you see that a lot. You know, especially in Nashville. You know, you'll you'll see you know Rumble Seat or, or Carter or somebody all of a sudden have a collection of mm-hmm. of somebody's yeah. stuff. I mean, yeah. I I've I've helped off some people off you know off collections like that, and um, it's and it, it's the greatest way to do it. You know, you can sign this stuff for people, and and you know you really don't have any cash outlay yeah, at no that risk. point. <laughs> no, mm. no risk, but you got to deal. You still got to deal with you know. Shipping yeah, and, well, and, yeah, and, yeah. And, and people and, and people <laughs> and people and and now you know and now the uh, the the ten ninety nines you're getting from mm-hmm. everybody the the reverb fixed that again this year right I saw that yeah yeah yeah, yeah no ten ninety nine from reverb this year again unless you do over ten thousand oh, dollars yeah. and two hundred transactions you have to meet both criteria I, you know, and, and real, really it should just be that it should be, that because there's be, a lot of hobbyists on yeah, there that, that will do close to ten and, and you know and and I mean you can make. 
you know, I hate to say this, but you can make ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars on one guitar. Yeah. You know, and and that's your whole year. You uh, you have a guitar that you've had f- since you were a kid. Right. You know, you got that Sunburst Les Paul that your parents bought you in nineteen fifty nine, and you just sold it for four hundred thousand dollars, and you're now you're going to be taxed on it. Literally just had a <laughs> visceral reaction. <Yeah. laughs> like, well, but now you know now uh, you know eBay is not that way, and neither is PayPal. You know right. those guys, but uh, mm. you know um, reverb owns all their own processing and stuff. And whether I love or hate reverb, that's a good thing that they're doing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they charge you $3 a hundred for insurance, but man, if you got a problem, they take care of it right now. Yeah, so yeah. you're just paying for the service. I th- yeah. I, I know a lot of people complain about their fees. I think for everything it provides and as easy as all my transactions, I mean, cause I'm used to going in a music store in old days, consignment fees were 15 or 20% music store. Right. So right, exactly. this is still dirt cheap and you may reach millions of people. So yeah. Yeah, you know? the thing I can't get used to is paying the sales tax on out of state. You know, I'm not. I, well, I don't like paying sales tax on used stuff well, anyway well, because well, somebody's already paid sales tax on it. Well, right. Once, well, wait but, a minute, Mark. You're not doing this correctly. You're, you sh- aren't you buying it for your business? Uh, and then therefore you don't pay sales tax. And then when you sell it, you collect sales tax. N- no, well, you're y- buying it as inventory. No, I don't have a. I I I don't have a. Uh, I I don't have a resale. Uh, a resale ID for. I, I think that costs like ten dollars or something. Well, <laughs> y- y- it does. It, 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 just saying, just saying. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, you know, I don't want to get myself in trouble. I, it's I, no, I, it's I, completely hundred percent legal. I, You're I, buying I'm, inventory. I'm keep. I keep the business I do now. I just keep completely yeah, under the radar, yeah. which is why I don't take. I don't take credit cards or anything like that because I don't want to have to charge people sales yeah, or collect sales tax. Yeah. My wife. My wife. My wife has a master's degree in accounting, so I. I just tell it. She just tells me what to do, and I do it. Right, right. <laughs> she knows more than I do. I'm sure. Very handy. Very no, handy. I, I understand exactly yeah. what you're saying, and and that's no, the way. You, yours is the when, cheaper way to do it. Probably. When I owned the store, yeah, we. Yeah. But the problem with that is, is getting especially pawn shops trying to get them to take your resale license. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, you know, they'll some of them will yeah. choose just not to sell to you because yeah. now they have to do paperwork too yep, and keep right. it on file. Absolutely. And it's a it's a major pain in the butt. But yeah, yeah let's not get into the nope, you know nope, nope. Sale, nah. sales tax the on used stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah. Rob. Screw that. Sorry yeah. about that. Thanks, Rob. That's all right. I was just trying to say <laughs> oh, no, I started it. It's <laughs> yeah. okay. It's okay. <laughs> So we've gone through the 90s, the 2000s, pretty much. You're out of Cowtown at this point, or? Yeah, so you moved out to open up the new store and then eventually moved the whole kit and caboodle out there in Vegas. Yes. And then how long were you out there doing that, and what were you doing with that store? Okay, um, that i got to think about for a second. Um, well, there was nothing going on musically at that point. Um, Bob Bob wasn't, Seeger wasn't going to tour. Um I'd left all the bands back here, and I really had no desire to play out there mm. at, at all. I never really got into the local music scene in, in Las Vegas too much. I, I mean, a lot of musicians out there are my friends, but I just never really got into the scene out there. Be- so, before before you go chronologically, uh, for someone who wasn't you know a, a growing up here, I've, you know, I didn't know that, but hmm. I know I'm familiar with the name Cowtown Guitars. So, like, what was the Maybe even from you guys, what was the thing? Why? Why did that? Why did it matter? The local store. Yeah, I would add the local, the local store, store and point. just yeah. maybe even the Vegas store, like because that it kind of blew up. Like at least I, I mean I know what it was, and I'm not from here. Well, I think the from my perspective, I mean when you looked at other stores that were here, and this might have been. I don't know if I don't think Sam was Sam Ash still had they moved in or Guitar Center yet. No, so I mean, if you were looking for something vintage mm-hmm. or used or whatever, and you know, Mark had an incredible knack of having really collectible as well as player grade instruments. Yeah, I was gonna say there's a lot of cool player grade stuff. I mean, some there. of the other places around here, you could, yeah, you could buy used things, but you're going to have to do setups and things yeah, like that. Yeah, and they typically weren't the cool things. Like, um, I mean, I, from your store before I even met you, I bought uh, an early '80s BC Rich Mockingbird, a neck through US made something. I bought a SG, like a 
70 mid 70s sg and i believe it's an sg but an sg um <laughs> but but in but in is like, it a historic or an historic <laughs> technically it's an historic <laughs> grammar police um but but for me you know being whatever 1920 at the time cowtown typically had just the cooler stuff the, yeah. the more that the player would want you know what I mean? Well, it's uh, you know, the reason for that is we were all musicians yeah. and we all liked cool guitars. Right. You know, there was nobody in there that really didn't like that. I mean, you guys know most of the people that worked with me there. Yep. And, uh, you know, and, and we all had a passion for that. Mm -hmm. And we were the place, we were also the only place you could go in and, and get any kind of money for something if you were selling something. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, we still needed to make money and all, you know, you always try to get it for as cheap as you can, but we still paid fair for so for to things. transplant something from the midwest to be able to work in las vegas what was the what was the draw there like why did that why did that like all of a sudden just kind of catch fire there a woman okay <laughs> no that's why i moved there to marry yeah. somebody well um, I, I i mean for the for the for the other people that aren't you well and the woman <laughs> yeah how'd the, how'd the business continue to grow and how did it have to yeah. change to well oh, yeah that that grow is a is a is not the word i would use exactly for this there was only one at that point in time there were a lot of music stores out there and but there was only one vintage shop which was aj's and uh, he and I had had a big, he and I had uh, had had a big deal over a guitar he sold me years before that. So I wanted nothing more than to, Pete, if you're listening to this, I forgive you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> well, I'll tell you the story real quick. Uh, you know, you were talking about, you know, before internet, you know, you'd wait to get that copy of Vintage Guitar Magazine because everybody had their ads in mm -hmm. there, you know, and you'd hope to get it early enough to, snag you know, before, to snag some yeah. stuff. So I bought a Gibson Modern from them, one of the reissue Moderns oh, wow. from, from them, uh, from AJ's in, in Las Vegas. They were like 650, 750 bucks in or something. So I get it. And uh, they sent it to me and, and, and neglected to tell me that somebody had put electrical tape at one per, at one point on the back of the guitar to spell out the words "eat me" ah. on the back of it. Well, the electrical tape was gone, but the silicone ate into the oh, it, no. it ate into the finish, so it was there permanently. And uh, and I called him and I said, "Hey, <laughs> you know what's this eat me stuff?" He goes, "Ah, oh, you bought it too cheap anyway." And that oh. was, and that was the end of it. And I went, "Okay, dude, I'm just gonna put a put a store in your right, town." That's what we're gonna do next. Yeah. So, um, um, so what happened is, said person uh, went out to spend some time with said other other female person out there who who who. Uh, uh, informed him at that time that that she did not want him to move out there. Ah, so that and you know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So it it fell apart. Uh, that fell apart, and then I met my ex wife Dina, <laughs> now ex wife, um, when I was on tour out there. So I decided to you know let's do a store out there. I was thinking, you know, I didn't really I didn't really research it like I should have. Um, I was thinking, yeah, this is Las Vegas. This is going to be a killer market for all this mm -hmm. stuff, blah, 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 blah. It couldn't have been worse. Wow. And, and I was literally right across the street from the college. Nothing. There's no music. It's more like a high school there than it is a, mm -hmm. it's not like Ohio State or anything. Um, the other thing, the other thing there was that I didn't realize. So I go, I, I get this building and I go down to the, go down to the, the, uh, the business, all, the, the, you know, the, uh, where they do licensing and all that license bureau down there. And I'm thinking I was going to waltz in here and get a business license, just like in Ohio, mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. You don't pay money. I'm going to do this, blah. Uh-uh. It's called a secondhand license. It can take up to a year or more to get. And before you can even get one, you have to have a building. So you can be, you know, you can be dormant there and paying wow. rent on something. Um, I was and and they do a complete 
FBI police background check on you, the whole ki- I mean, you know, you, you never written down references on something and nobody cares. These people called and, and some wow. of my friends were answering the phone joking, you know, oh, oh. no, he didn't really do that. Yeah, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> no, he's really like, you know, and I'm, oh, man. So they really do that. Uh, the only reason I got my license within two months is my ex-wife is pretty dialed in Las Vegas and she had a, an attorney friend that knew all the people down oh. there and they walked me through very quickly, but Ooh. they almost weren't going to give me a business license because of the partner I had here. Wow. I had to get rid of the partner. And um, so it's a big deal. Then anything you buy, you got to fill out. Yeah, you got to fill out paperwork on everything, send it down to the pawn squad and hold for 30, 30 days mm. yeah. um, while they do a check on it. And if it turn here, if it turns out stolen, the person it was stolen from, if they want it back, they got to pay you what you mm-hmm. paid for it out there. They don't. Out there, oh, you, you just, just turn it give over. It back. Now, here's the kicker uh, on on the secondhand license out there. It's basically a pawn license, but you're not allowed to loan money. Mm. That, that's what a secondhand license is. Anything anybody right. doing used goods, you hold for thirty days, but they're ninety days behind on on checking on things. So you put something on your wall, you know, and and sixty days later, you think you got it, you're safe, and some guy comes in, hey, somebody, that's my guitar. Somebody stole it. Go, well, I've had it for thirty days. Doesn't matter. You lose it anyway. So yeah. you're not really wow. safe on it. It's a big pain in the ass, and it, is. it gets very expensive having you know a hundred thousand dollars sitting in the back of your store that you can't sell can't right sell. now, just you mm-hmm. know because you're waiting on that. So and then that when was you a, do sell it, you almost hope you sell it internet or sell well, it like. But right once away. you sell once you sell it to somebody, let's say let's say I sell you a guitar that Joe Blow comes up to you in a bar and says, "Hey, that was my guitar. It was stolen." You know, and before he punches you, you know, you go, "No, I bought this guitar. It's called third party harmless." So you technically own the guitar at that point, and he's screwed. And he's going to punch you anyway. But you know, <laughs> so that's the way that works. It, the all the 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 Nevada laws are all just a constant constant. Um, uh, uh, what do I want to say here? Uh, I had the had the word. Now I can't think of it. Uh, contradiction. They're they're a constant okay. contradiction of each other. It's it's messed up. Hmm. It's completely yeah. messed up. So anyway, um, where were we? So we're talking about, <laughs> so so I, I said you know so they moving on oh, to uh... so the store was doing terrible out there. Wow. Um, some stuff stuff was walking in some because nobody prior to me coming there nobody paid for stuff they were all you know all the stores were like stealing stuff from people mm. and there were um it's funny you don't see out there you don't see like any old Marshall stuff or Vox stuff there was no dealers for it in the 60s because it, it just was just like a, Fender stuff out there a though? lot of Fender stuff um a lot of Fender stuff a ton of Ibanez stuff especially early Ibanez That's because cool. there were like three dealers out there selling Ibanez at the same time huh. that kind of stuff so I would get some stuff in there and I I would do a show here and there but but most of my sales were were th- uh internet sales or or you know vintage guitar mail order yeah it's the only thing that kept us kept us going so you're paying the for the brick and mortar, the yeah. storefront and everything, but weren't. Right. Yeah. And that location was just the worst being across from the college. So when that lease was up, we moved down um, to a center down the street from there um, next to what Mars Music had moved in there. We didn't have, they had a guitar center years before that and it failed miserably. Then they got a musician's friend store. Mm-hmm. Oh, they wow. had one of the only that. musician's friend store, but they didn't do used right. at all. But they had Mars Music in there. And the center that I was in was literally in the same parking lot as Mars Music, but the two buildings were owned by different people. So there was no exclusivity clause that they could use on me. So I moved down right next to the other big music store. Mm -hmm. And uh, that worked out pretty well for for a while. Um, And then I ended up... Ended up going back out with um, Bob. Uh, they called me to go do the Rock and Roll Hall, Bob's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame induction, and then we toured after that. So I was kind of like absentee from the shop quite a bit from that, and that's when Jesse started working for me at that point, and that's who I ended up selling the uh, selling the shop to in 2011. Now, okay. when Pawn Stars started, that was. Um, let, let me back up again. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. There's a lot of stuff going when, on. When I was on tour in 2007 is when Pawn Stars started. In the meantime, I had done the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Then I did the 2005 and six tour with Seeger. Uh, 
I, I, the, the person I moved out there to be with and I got divorced. Ended up, I ended up with somebody else that I'm still with to this day. Uh, she had, um, she was divorced and had two kids with said ex-husband. They moved to Oklahoma and, uh, from, from Las Vegas. So, and so I ended up moving down there. I bought a house down in Tulsa. So I left the shop in Vegas, left other people to run it. This is 2007, which was not the smartest thing in the world to do. Right. Okay. okay. So I'm living in I'm living in Tulsa, and I'm on tour. And Jesse called and said, "Hey, Rick from Gold and Silver, call. We know all those guys, you know, yeah. for years." And uh, Rick Rick said, "You know, they're doing some TV show, and do we want to come down and and uh, you know and appraise the guitar and stuff?" I said, "Yeah, you know, we all thought it would." you know, right. be Nothing. a sizzle reel and be done. So Jesse ends up, you know, going down there and then the show ends up being renewed and blah, blah, blah. So I was living in Tulsa and on tour. So he's the one that ended up doing the show. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's how that all, that all happened. Okay. So I sold him the store in 2011 cause I just wanted out of it. Then, then I severed my ties with, with Seeger at that point. So I basically did nothing for five years. Nothing at all. Nothing music related. Nothing music related, nothing business related other than buying and selling, you know, some guitars here and there. And at that point in time, doing more selling than buying. And and that's kind of that's kind of how that uh, that's kind of how that happened. Then I I uh, then Seeger called called me in 2017, said, hey, do you want to go back out on the road? I never thought in a million years that that would happen. And I almost wasn't going to do it. I, I thought about it and uh, I said, give me 24 hours. And basically my mom and my, my wife talked me into it. They said, you know, just go do it. It's good money, go do it. So I went and did it. And uh, we toured part of 2017 to part of 2018 and all of 2019. We got done right before the plague hit. Wow. And then uh, I've always, I've been trying to move back to Columbus since I moved to Las Vegas. You know, it's 23 years of being painful in Las Vegas and Tulsa. Blah. Um, <laughs> sorry, Tulsa. Sonny, how do you, how do you really feel? Yeah. If you're anybody listening from Tulsa, just lost you know, 12 Tulsa listeners. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, if you live there, you know what I'm talking about. It's actually, it's actually a beautiful place, and it's actually, you know, it reminds you of Ohio. It really does. All Oklahoma reminds you of Ohio, but there's just nothing to do much down mm. there. Uh, good, good motorcycle place, though. Good place to ride motorcycles. Anyway. Um, so, uh, the opportunity during, during the pandemic, the opportunity presented itself for us to sell our house there and, uh, and come back to Ohio. And we've been back here for a little over about a little over two years, just a little bit, just about two years now. And there's not a molecule in my body that, that, uh, that regrets coming back here. Yeah. And you also, uh, started another business with the most... That's the best name I think you got. You ever and, came and up with? I can't. I didn't come up with it. I can't no? take credit for it. Rob McNally. Okay. Google him. He plays on everybody's country stuff. One of the best guitar players you'll ever see in your life, uh, and a Columbus guy. Yeah. He's from uh, Rob's from Columbus, uh, but yeah, no, he's a plus list Nashville studio guy. Uh, no, he actually thought of the name. He goes, man, if you ever do this again, you ought to call it trademark guitars. And I went, <laughs> okay, and I did. So, yeah, that's so great. that's that. Yeah. And yeah, he he's uh, Seeger's Bob's Seeger's other guitar player. I gotcha. tour with him and uh, and some other guys that play with a bunch of people. That uh, I look at myself every night on that stage. Well, when we were touring, I'd look at myself every night on that stage and go, "What the hell am I doing up here with these guys?" <laughs> you know? That's awesome. Yeah. That's the dream, though. To always feel like yeah. you're you're the lesser musician. You're always surrounded by the better players. You yeah. Know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the first one was with with you know. I'm I lived with... a dream all the time. Yeah, well, we know that's <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah, I got to look at Billy Payne and Kenny Arnoff all night for a year. You know, I'm going. Oh what my the hell? goodness! Jeez. What am I doing here? Yeah. Um, so that's anyway, great. that's uh, that, that's kind of what. So, me. And, so, oh, so yeah, I do trademark guitars, but it's but it's a I I still it's a hobby, buy it's a hobby business. It's yeah. a hobby, and recently I've been super 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 busy, so it's kind of been. And mm-hmm. I don't want to say I'm, you know, uh, I don't want to say I'm over it, but I, I'm just not, I just don't want to do it as much as I used to. Well, and, and, and from somebody from the outside looking in, it, it seems like the stuff just kind of gravitates to you somehow. Somehow the stuff finds you. 
If it didn't, I wouldn't be buying anything. But I know enough people around here that I get phone calls, you yeah. know, with, and, and so a couple of stores here actually refer people to me. And uh, I got a referral yesterday about a 68 335. That's really, really nice. So, yeah. Um, uh, so yeah, that comes around, but I, I just want to keep it on my own terms as a hobby. I keep some stuff, um, you know, and, and, and I help, I broker some stuff for people too. That's kind of what I prefer to do. It's easier and, and, uh, works out. They make more money on it that way. And, and nobody's in any big hurry. Yeah. So, um, I, somewhere in, in your discussion, uh, when Cowtown was out in Vegas and everything, and then going to Oklahoma, how the market was, had already been, uh, um, Picked um, over. Yeah, picked over. Yeah. It, it, do you think the vast majority of stuff, there's no more uh, barn finds or grandpa's guitar that's in the closet? Most of it's circulating now? I would say most of it is, but it's not over. You know, just when you think it is. So you still come across. Just when you think it's over, something super cool just shows I, up. And I know guys. I mean, I know guys, like, uh, for example, Elliot down, down at Rumble Seat. All the time, he's getting a one owner, you know, somebody, family bringing a Sunburst Les Paul in, or he just got a, uh, you know, a one owner, um, uh, original owner, 68 Paisley Telecaster with every piece of of literature that ever came with it that's just immaculate under the bed find. Mm. They're still out there. I mean, because they, I mean, they, they produced thousands and thousands of guitars and, and, and that's what still blows me because i also have uh, i'll have a you know whatever a 60 whatever champ come in and it's completely mm-hmm. unmolested i'm like how and and Isn't i see a different way you can say that well <laughs> yeah we, we, well yeah but that's the you know because we consider Unfettered. it yeah uh, yeah it's a hundred percent original raise the bar right um, yeah. but you know i'll have one of those come in every month or every two months and i'm like how many of these things are out there well it's a lot like i mean that you know just for i always bring up les paul juniors because it's like my favorite guitar but they made thousands of them i mean i mean i've got oh, the production records tens, th- one, tens of thousands yeah, of those that's guitars that's in 1959 amazing. alone you know the white, S, the, the, the white one you were playing the, the other night that was that was cool oh yeah i actually have two of those i have a 63 and 64 the the one that i was playing the other night yeah. was a referral i bought it here in columbus uh three years ago and it was a referral from a drummer friend of mine from a family that had had it since it was brand new. That's wild. And I bought the guitar without ever seeing it. Yeah. And uh, and so, it's, so the, it's become it's actually my favorite guitar right now. I love it. it's a '64 White SG Junior. For those you of you play it like it's your favorite one. Yeah, it's I mean, a honestly, great guitar. You can tell when you when somebody well, picks it up. Well, here, here's a, a, a another real quick story about like kind of like that. Um, and I was here visiting for one reason or another. I don't know four or five years ago, and Dave Bush calls me, and. Uh, he goes, uh, he's a local repair guy. Local this, repair yeah. guy and worked at Cowtown for, for, yep. for a while and uh, and a champion skateboarder, <laughs> yes. a world-famous skateboarder. <laughs> anyway, he uh, uh, he called me and he goes, man, I got this guy bringing in a, a 1959 ES355. Um, is that something you might be interested in? I go, well, yeah, you know, I would be. And he goes, well, I'll send you some pictures. I go, no, Dave, I'm in Columbus. <laughs> right now, I am in, and he had no idea. I said, I'm in Columbus right now. And I said, I can be there in 20 minutes. He goes, come on over. So this guy walks in with this uh, factory, mono, mono cherry 59, 355 that has, you know, those stick on, you know, initial letters, you know, mailbox letters, I call them. Yeah. And it had them on there and opens a case. And I see those. And I went, oh my God. That guitar walked into Whitey Lunzar's when I worked there. <laughs> wow. And and I wanted it then. Uh, and almost 50 years later, 40 some odd years later, here it is at Dave Bush's place. And it's not his. It belongs to this guy's wife, but it was her husband's. Wow. And somehow they got a referral through Dave, to, uh, Dave somebody saying, do you know anybody that knows anything about guitars? And somebody knew Dave, and that's how it is. And Dave knew me yeah. and called me, and uh, and bam, done. You know, I have the guitar. I have two that's of them. Awesome. And, that's awesome. Uh, but, uh, yes, yeah, something I saw down down there that long ago, you know, <laughs> brings itself back to me. And that, I, I actually have bought back some some guitars that I sold over the years since I've been back here. That that I've always wanted to reown, mm-hmm. uh, you know, reown again, and and oh, that's there, there's a couple that people won't sell me, that that I'm, you know, I'm still working on. 
Well, we're going to wrap things up here. I have a couple more questions. Uh-oh. Yeah. Um, so how do you determine the worth? I mean, do you use... I mean, right now it's relatively easy to look online. You can see what the ballpark range of prices. I mean, do you use guidebooks? Do you use your gut? What do you? Can, can I append that uh, that question? There's price and there's also value. Okay. So that that might be a ten thousand dollar guitar, but it's really more worth like a twenty thousand dollar guitar to the right person. Mm. Or or. Um, or it's worth le- worth less because one sold one idiot paid that much money for for one that does not make them all worth that much Fair. money yeah. right, right. Um, it, and and it, there there are a lot of factors in there you know is it popular you know is it something people want just because it's old doesn't mean it's valuable and everybody mm-hmm. thinks everything old is valuable yeah you're talking and, about the, how the people have the wrong information there you go right you know, just because right. it's old and, it's not and, valuable and some, well my neighbor said it's worth this or you know I saw a picture of one that looks kind to like mine, you know, and yeah. then you try to tell them that's why it's not like theirs. And they don't want to hear um, it. <laughs> so in answer to your question, uh, Tony, the answer is yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you, um, you do as much homework as you can and then try to... The, it's, it's all of the above. It's, yeah. it's, it's gut. Now, me, I will tend to pay more for something that I really like. Right. You know, I, 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 that's, that's a fault of mine. Um, but, uh, you know, the price guides, not so much because they, they're not updated no. enough. And things can change on, you know, things can change on, 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 on the snap of a finger because, you know, because Joe Bonamassa played one on stage last night or something mm-hmm. like that, that, that all, everybody wants to be like their fave rave and mm-hmm. it makes things like those, you know, those bad monkey pedals, mm-hmm. you yeah. know, that, that those, and those have crashed again. Oh, crashed hard. <laughs> but, you know, but that, that's all it takes. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, unfortunately, you have to look at. I I tend to, to look at what people are, you know, asking for things on reverb. That doesn't mean that's what they're selling for. That means right. what people are asking for them. And I try to average it out, and I see how long it's been for sale. And you mm-hmm. tell people, go, hey, there's one that what you're asking. It's been for sale for two years for that price, so it's not worth that much money. I'm sorry, you know. And yeah. this is what I can give you. And if if that doesn't work for you, then here's here's reverb.com you know yeah. you go on there you go then then you go you know you go on there you pay them their percentage and then you know since it's over 600 bucks you know you don't you can't say it now but you could last year yeah you know then you deal with the 1099 yeah. Yeah, a lot of people don't want to deal with that now mm-hmm. i mean that know about it oh, yeah. mm-hmm. um, that's actually a good buying thing for anybody that's buying and selling goods well, that, that leads me to my next question. I mean, where do you think the, the guitar show market is going? Because a lot of people, if you go to a guitar show, there's lots. It's one of the only places left, I think, that you see piles of cash being exchanged. Yeah. And so I think it's one way for some people, maybe they have a valuable instrument. Maybe they won't get as much, but they'll have a cash Settlement. It, it depends on the show you go to, and and as you know from being at guitar shows a lot, uh, the lion's share of those deals are mm. dealer to dealer, right. not not public. Before the doors even open. Before yep. the doors even open. Yep. Out in the parking lot. Blah blah blah. Yep. You rarely see people walk in with anything anymore. Um, it do, not to say it doesn't happen. It does. And some people, you know, make appointments with people that bring stuff in, mm-hmm. but it's mostly dealer to dealer. And then they have them, you know, the dealers have a network of people that they, that they call and, and, or they're looking for, for something right. like that. Um, you know, I think it, I think it's got a, it, it the, the prices, uh, you know, every man though, the prices of everything have gone up. You know, mm. you thought the people wouldn't buy cars when the when when you know when a year ago you were paying more than sticker for anything and paying paying a sticker price for a used car. Yeah. You know, people thought people wouldn't buy, but they but they but they are. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I don't see an end in sight at this point. It's like you know, can Les Paul Juniors become twenty thousand dollars? I keep bringing up Les Paul Juniors. That's your the favorite. thing, like we talk but about like, them a lot. You know, Sun, <laughs> Sunburst Les Pauls. You know, at one point, you know, were six, seven hundred thousand dollars, things like that. Those have settled down. There's only so many people that buy right. that you know that caliber of guitar. 
But the 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 median stuff, the under twenty thousand dollars stuff, you know, I right now I still see it going up, mm-hmm. but I don't see a I. I, I don't see a lot of stuff selling right now. The past six months mm. looks like things have, have slowed down. I've not been to a guitar show other than the Columbus one, but I talk to people that do go and they're they're not most of them are not as well attended as they as they used to be. Right. And once again, it's mostly, you know, looky lose. They'll come in, they'll buy a t shirt or they'll buy you know, stuff from, remember J.K. Luther, he used to, you know, mm-hmm. he'd, he'd be selling, you know, books and all that stuff like that. People mm-hmm. will buy that. You can get somebody to spend 10 bucks, yep. 20 bucks. But, you know. The- I, I think it's difficult uh, having, looking back on the last couple and even, uh, you know, we were just talking about going out to the Dallas one. And I actually watched a video of somebody who filmed the whole Dallas one from last year. And, it was, and, and the whole thing was, this is, it's almost like just going to a retail store. Like the the yeah. prices that people are putting on used stuff, it's like, dude, it's a used pedal. It's you're tr- you you actually have that priced almost what it is for retail. Right. Like, w- what well, w- what you, am I doing? You here? know, and the other thing you got to remember too is like what, what uh, I had mentioned was when internet became a thing and and kind of I don't want to say killed the guitar show thing, but it made it much more accessible. You didn't have to wait for the guitar show and everything. Well, now the dealers have the same advantage. They get in, you know, a sixty three whatever. They don't have to wait till the next show. They put it up on Reverb. They they pay their eight percent. And right. they flipped it overnight, you know. So, right. so the the really cool stuff generally won't be at the shows, or at least not for a very fair price, because they've already sold it. Right. You know, they're bringing the stuff that, for whatever reason, in their area can't sell, which then they sell to another dealer from another area. Says, oh, that'll go in my area. Let's right. work out a deal. And well, and it's like it's like the new retailers. There's like the the custom shop people we were talking about that carry nothing but you know the right real the high boutique. End. Some stores. of those places, there you know, there's a handful of those places, and they all do real good. Mm-hmm. It's the same in the vintage world. Um, there's a, a, a boatload of little mom and pop shop, you know, all over the place. They, they do okay, but like most of the Nashville shops do great because of the, the concentrated, you know, uh, the, the musician concentration down there. And those guys, I mean, and, and I know some of the guys that do that, they decide they need something right now and they go and they pay whatever it is. I mean, they get the prices down there are higher than they are anywhere else because they can get it. There's also yeah. the tour and, factor of to, to, the tourist factor because like I'm down here. I'm in Music City. I'm going to get a guitar at Music, you know, it's like right. you, you're you're much more liable to to drop more ducats than you normally would because <laughs> you have now the experience. Well, my walk in Vegas business was was mostly tourists like that, especially when there'd be a convention like NAB convention there, National Association of Broadcasters, mm-hmm. all the guys from Europe would be in and stuff. And, you know, we'd always sell yeah. stuff during those, during those things. Mm-hmm. But it's the same. I mean, you know, the L.A. shops do OK. There's virtually almost nothing left in New York City. Um, yeah. you know, it's, you know, 48th street's been gone for a long time, but, um, there, there's only a couple of actual brick and mortar vintage guitar stores mm-hmm. left in that city now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's a handful of stores that are doing really, really well and everybody else does okay. And, you know, as long as you're not trying to become a gazillionaire, you know, Chicago's become a, a, a hot spot again. Mm-hmm. Chicago, Chicago music does really well. And, um, uh, 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 Midwest buy and sell does making music. He carries yep. vintage and and mm-hmm. uh, you know and boutique. He's yeah. always carry boutique stuff. It definitely but. seems to me though that to your point, it, there's a division there now. I think about it that you've got the boot. It, boutique dealers that'll carry the the Sir, the Grosh, the Bogner, the Doctor Z, those kind of stuff, and they'll have some used stuff. But it seems like that you have that, and then you have the use the Carters that might right. have some of that stuff, but they really focus on. Right. You it, 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 you're worlds. forgetting about like you know like Oakland, which is boutique gear or, or about half boutique gear, and and just but but not boutique as you're what you're saying. There's like the top shelf boutique stuff, and then there's you know like. People that we've had on the show for several yeah, years. Yeah, which yeah, is yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Like when, you know, when I necessarily say boutique, I'm just imagining the, the the you know the Bogner. Yeah, the, yeah. The, the, yeah. More, the I mean, they're boutique that they're not Fender, but they're not really boutique. They're right. not two right. guys on a. Well, you see, know. you know, and and part of that uh, part of that thing with the with well with the inflation. You know, we were asking me about the inflation of the of the guitars are 
how much brand new stuff has gotten to be, mm-hmm. you know, crazy, you know, it's just, in, yeah, it's just insane. Gibson prices are insane. I could never get that. I could never get why somebody would go spend $10,000 on a brand new guitar when, you know, at that point in time, they could have bought a really cool vintage guitar for that much money. Same with, you know, you know, spending ten or $15,000 on a private stock Paul Reed Smith guitar or something, you know, that you're going to take out of there and it's going to be worth 7,000 yeah. bucks on a good day. Mm-hmm. You know, there, there's one person that wants that guitar and you're him. <laughs> right. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, know, you are the market. <laughs> you know? yeah. So I never got that. I, yeah. I really didn't. You know, just like, you know, somebody will come and call me and go, hey, can you come appraise my collection? And, and you go over, mm-hmm. you know, and it's three current Gibson R9s and blah, blah, blah. I said, I can't, you know, there is no appraisal for that. Just go on and see how much people are just right, going they're all see over how the much place. they are. Yeah, you know, right. that's that's it. Yeah. You know, end of story. So I, I I call that an accumulation, not a collection. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> that's nice way of putting it. Uh, but yeah, that's I I've mean got, all of, one the, of those. The, all all of those factor all those things factor in. And you know, the inflation on new stuff is just can't help but make the old stuff keep going, you know. Keep, yeah. You know, you gotta go spend four thousand dollars on on a used something that you used to be able to or a brand new something that you used to be able to buy a great used something you know for less than that but yeah. it's not that way anymore yeah i guess the thing is though you know it, 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 they're not making any more 65 deluxe reverbs they're not making any more right. you know so it's it is well, and then it you, is. You, you get into the now you get it i know we're going way over time here <laughs> Um, it, it, <laughs> are you happy you, about that? <laughs> you also get into the thing, though, with, with you know, if you want to get into a, a a debate about that kind of stuff, is 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 that stuff really m- that much better? Mm. And the answer to that question is no, because I've owned as many shitty pre CBS Stratocasters as I ha- as I have go- uh, really right. good ones. Right. Just like all PAF pickups do not mm. sound good. Mm. I'm sorry. And there are new amplifiers out there that'll sound as good or better than anything anything old. It's just yeah. just the way it is. Now, if you feel like you got to have the old stuff and you owned one as a kid or something like that, then that's fine. But there's no guarantee when you're buying this stuff that it's the beat all end all. And I mean. You know, do I play some vintage stuff on stage? I do, but mostly I don't. You know, mostly I play newer stuff because I can get the same result out of that guitar. And there are two guys in the audience that I'm pointing to right now that know I'm playing a cool vintage guitar. The rest of people don't even know if I'm playing guitar or bass. You know, they, they don't, and they don't care. So, um, you know, it's. Uh, I don't even know where I was going with that, but but it, it, you know, o- older. Is not necessarily better. It's, it's the, then, then you got Jim Irsay or Irsay, the guy from the the Colts, you mm-hmm. know, that has a, a billion a billion dollar guitar collection. You know, he's paid just Tubsy. paid like a million seven for the Fool guitar. Oh my! You God. know, he owns God. virtually every cool guitar that's you know that any, anybody ever used. But and and that's cool. And he shows the stuff off. You know, he does shows with it. That's 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 one thing. You yeah. know, and, and he can. Well, somebody's got to own it. So yeah, exactly. You know? And and the stuff is coming up for sale because people are going, well, you know, uh, let's sell this now because we're at the top of the heap and there's somebody out there that's got some money, but where does it go from there? You know, it does it stay in a permit display. Once again, the generation coming up, some of the people, I mean, there's some really cool bands out now, like dirty honey, you Mm -hmm. know, bands like that, that are using old gear again and making, making (laughs) that whole thing happen. But that, that, it's starting to well, happen again, but the generation prior to that didn't give a good rat's mm, ass about vintage mm, guitars. Period. Well, no, and, and now the thing is, it's it's gone so so high in price that that where you know the twenty year olds, if they want to get into vintage stuff, it's a huge gap. It's not like they're they're getting stuff from the last generation. They have to go back four or five generations it's now at this price point. Right. You know. Right. Or you know, and and that and that's why that's why a company like Gibson can justify you know uh, a, a Murphy aged R nine being fourteen thousand dollars because the real thing's going to cost you four hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. So and that's their justification. So for if that. you want to say Gibson and be yeah mm-hmm. yeah exactly okay all, all right. right. <laughs> We've solved the problems of the world. Yes. <laughs> Let's all open up vintage guitar stores. Oh, God, no. Yeah. Legitimately, though, 
I I love the fact that we could go for hours more talking with you. <laughs> I, I really appreciate that about you being here. So thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I'm not sure I'm good for 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 more hours right now. Maybe not right now. Not without a nap included. <laughs> yeah. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we'll uh, so well, we could time. we could hobble him and then yeah, yeah. he'd be yeah. here for yeah. the next couple of shows. You've seen Misery, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We got one more little thing here. We're gonna do. Yes. Yes. So at this point of the show, there's a little game we like to play called Would You Rather. You got to work on that, man. It's rough. Well, you know, no one. <laughs> what can... are you doing? Uh, hey, I'm doing everything <laughs> else. We can talk about. You could just have him do it once and sample it. Then yeah. you just that's have what, it. Well, that's, that's what, what we need. That's what we need to do. Yeah. I said that years ago. Okay. But, you know, <laughs> normally our buddy Jared does this, okay. but he is. I will make a point of doing that. Okay, yeah, everybody. Sample Jared. Will, that way he's always I will on just the show. Have a sample. I can go there. there that would go. be good. Yeah. Yeah. Go, yeah. You got a button for it. All right. So uh, this uh, would you rather is brought to us by our good friend Bruce Bacon. Yes, Brucey. Um, I get hungry every time I hear that name. Yes. Um, Bruce? No, yeah. Bacon. Yeah, Bacon. <laughs> so he sent us a holiday themed would you rather. Yeah. You know that. Mm -hmm. um, everyone loves the Bing and Bowie little drummer boy. The duet. That Iconic. They, yes. Except Bing. <laughs> well, Bing didn't much Bing, like Bing it. Bing didn't much like it. He no, didn't quite yeah. get no. David. <laughs> Neither did my mom. Uh, yeah. I remember doing the, we were doing the Christmas tree, and, and, she, and I looked at her, and she had her nose all wrinkled up, and I was like, what? I, I thought it was cool. What's, what's with the weird yeah, guy on yeah, Bing weird. show? <laughs> and then I was like, it's like Tom no, Jones and Janis cool. Joplin. Huh? Yeah, yeah. That was a good one, too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this is this iconic pop culture moment. Yes. Has one flaw. There's no guitar. There's no guitar. So, as guitar yes. knobs, you have access to the time machine. Uh, I love the time machine. And you can rectify this problem by replacing Bowie and the song. Bob Perk er, Bob. <laughs> Moan and Rob perked up when you said rectify. He's like, oh, oh. Yeah. I like to rectify. Come on. Back keep to your going. thing. Keep going. <laughs> so, the would you rather that Bruce poses to us. Now, Bing stays. Of course, it's his show. Okay. Has to. Would you rather have Bing duet with Greg Lake from Emerson, Lake, and Palmer playing I Believe in Father Christmas? Or uh, with Buck Owens and his buckaroos playing Santa looked a lot like Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Those are the only two choices? <laughs> Those are. Well, if you can come up with a better one. Th this is my, my most favorite segment of the show. <laughs> Sarcasm yeah. inserted yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Because it's always like uh, those are the choices. Well, yeah. oh, oh, dude, why don't you just sip up this one out, okay? <laughs> <laughs> we could throw the kinks in there too. No. No, no man. Slade did a great Christmas song. I just heard it on the radio tonight. Oh, really? Yeah. What was it? I can't think of the name of it. Something Christmas. I don't know. Something Christmas. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but Slade. That's convenient. Yeah, no, Slade did Slade did. I'd rather see him with Slade. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That> would, <laughs> I think he'd be be begging for Bowie after yeah, that. Absolutely, little naughty holder. So let's uh, <laughs> okay. let's start off with Tony, and we'll go around the go around the uh, ring here. Go ahead. I got to go with Buck and the Buckaroos. Come on, who doesn't love a song named Santa looked a lot like Daddy? That's mm. fair. That's I fair. It. And All right, you got some some good twanging going on. Yeah, there. Rob, Buck, Buck. Okay, yep. I I'm going with Buck. Todd, B Todd. Yeah. Now, I think. One of the things that, that makes that kind of a special piece, really, is that it, it feels almost a little ethereal. Bowie lends that to to it a little bit, and it's like it just you, you it's dreamlike, and it's and it's it makes you stop and listen. They whatever they did, it makes you listen. He has a little bit of that quality to his music as as well. Who Greg like? Yeah. Oh yeah. So I thought, well, that would actually, it would probably sound better. 
But I want to see Buck Owens play. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah. I'm surprised they didn't. They, he didn't offer up John and Yoko. Oh my! You know, with their Christmas song. All right. Well, thank you, Bruce. Yes, Bruce. Thank you. Indeed, that was a good one, Tony. I think we got some people to thank. And we then we're gonna let do. our good friend Mark go. Yes, we are. We are. Yeah, I we? thought we're, we're keeping him for the next show. Oh, yeah, Misery. That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right, Todd, because at this point of the show, I there's a, a union f- break here sooner or later. <laughs> <laughs> no. We're going to strip we you got, down and have Billy Paint you. circus peanuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They're all uh, you can eat. That's a big old thing, too. Yeah, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right, Todd. There's a special group of people we love to thank. These are our executive producers. Now, what's an executive? Executive producer? An executive producer makes the show possible. How do you become one? Head over to patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Check out a couple different levels in which you can participate. Become a member, a sponsor, a patron, a hero, a friend of the podcast. Mm -hmm. Each level comes with some very nice thank you gifts. And I do mean very nice. We try. But as an example. And great giveaways. And oh, the giveaways? Circus peanuts. We, yeah. We're giving circus peanuts away. Maybe. They'll be kind of stale by the day. Keep going, there. Tony. In addition to all that great stuff, uh-huh. there's one thing more. Jared, what you would that be? You get to have your name read right on the thing. Your name read on the thing. So that's what I'm going to do right now. So special thanks to these executive producers. Vader and Pedals, John Halverson, Rick Calhoun, Trevor Gunberg, Elad Mizrahi, Mike D., Richard Kendall, James White, Motander Guitars, Anthony Gemolero, Bill Gola Guitars, John Esterly, Anthony Lathrop, Stefan Lamb, Michael Senchuk, Ken Sayers, Doug Christ, Darren Gregory, Tom Brazen, Rusty Sneeden, Ralph Gottschalk from Wonderful Audio Technology. What? Mm-hmm. Don Kloss. Gregory Randall, Brett Hogarth, Eric Hemmer, Stuart George, Michael Furman, James Bell, James Romer, James and James, Cameron Pampas, David Tindall, Trevor Ellenberg, and Christopher Logan. Ah, I love that list. Oh, but there's more, Todd, because there's a special group of executive producers. We call them our Grand Poobas. Yes. They wear a fez upon their hell, their hell, their yeah, their, their head. Yes, whilst listening to the podcast. Yes, and we and they're located uh, at a special coop sitting atop the last remaining Spires restaurant in the country. Where's that? I don't know. It's there though. It's there somewhere. Well, they'll be there. Drinking some orange liquid of of some sort. Go, Tony. So special, special, special thanks to these grand poobas. Tommy Manasco, Ricardo Igareda, David Kaminga, Brandon Wow Pickups, Hex Matos, Michio Murakishi, Bob Crouch, Jack Cadian, Sam Jett, Tyler Casey Rines, LSJ Music Company, John Williams, James Pennington, Steve Keys, Cody Foster, Science of Sound, Brian Robison, Jonathan Jerusik, Corey Nigro, Michael Van Zant, Tim Nowak, Jonathan Daly, Martin Cliff, Sean S. S. David Poe, Billy Spitfire Unlimited, Congregation Gear Demos, Paul Von Eppinger, Scott Sullivan, Great Lakes Guitar Pickups, Matt Hart, Enrico Fernando, Moon Guitars, Adam Johnson, and Eric Edwards. Oh, man. Thank you guys so much. We're going into the new year. And if you're thinking about something that's like, hey, I want to do something this new year. You know what? Be a patron. Support the show. Keep this going. And uh, we'll thank you for it. Yes, we will. We're going to have so many great uh, new giveaways um, in this upcoming year. I know it. I can feel it in my bones. Yes, you can. All right. (laughs) We need to first say a humongoid thank you to Mark for joining us tonight and sharing so much of your uh, history and wisdoms and silliness. We love that. <laughs> Above all. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so thank you for thank you for being here tonight. And my opinions that are going to get me in trouble with manufacturers oh, all over the place. No. <laughs> no. Open conversation. They don't listen to it. <laughs> um, now, all right, plug time. Where can people go to see the things that you're involved in? Um, trademarkguitars.com, uh, thegodsusa.com with a Z. 
with a Z, and guitar knobs is not with a Z. No. Could be. Could be. Could be. <laughs> be a whole lot cooler for us. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> oh, <would>. man. <laughs> it's funny. Our store in, in Tulsa was called Cupcakes with a Z. K-U-P-C-A-K-Z. My wife hated Ooh. it, but everybody loved it. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah, the guitar, the, the GodsUSA.com and TrademarkGuitars.com, and I think that's about all I got to plug at Sounds this good. point. Sounds yeah, good. Cool. Well, uh, be keep your ears out for uh, what Mark's doing uh, in the future. And um, Tony, how about yourself? Head over to PickGuardian.com. Check out some of the things that I do. But you know what I do? Mostly I do custom work. Custom work. So shoot me an email. Let me know what you're trying to do, what you're trying to look like. Sure. Make your guitar your own. Okay. Would you do that? I'll try. Do that for me, please. Yes. I might actually do that over again. Yes. I'll tell you about it after. Uh, after. <laughs> I have an idea. He has yes. an idea. <laughs> oh, boy. All right. Uh, Moan and Rob. <laughs> like he just, he's like pointing at me. No, no, no. Boom, 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 I get my own theme song. I like that. Okay, that's cool. Uh, MadCowAmplification.com, Instagram, Facebook. That's about it. Right. Go watch and listen to Rob moan about amplifiers. I don't only moan. <laughs> All right. Uh, you can shoot me an email, Todd at theguitarnobs.com. You can also DM me on Instagram where I think you'll have maybe even better luck at Guitar Knobs. We'd love to hear what you're up to, what you like about the show. Share anything you want. Um, we will listen. And hey, also, I bought some Would You Rathers. Exactly. We got a whole pile of them uh, recently. I want a whole pile more. So do that. Uh, check out the Valentinos wherever you can download music or listen to music or whatever. And uh, I think we'll just uh, leave it. What What are you doing? Your stomper. The stomper. If you've got a Line 6 HX stomp, uh, specifically that one, that's the one that seems to sell most more than anything. Uh, and you need to protect your knobs, people. Get yourself a stomp. Keep them safe. To protect your stomp. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, at flintfx.com. Ten bucks. What's it going to hurt? Just do it. And it'll look cool, too. All right. Thank you, one and all. Have a fantastic guitar week and a new year whenever this lands. And subscribe! Oh, yeah. Yeah. And beyond. And then what you think the future I tend to go off on tangents, I'll tell you. Now, my stories get to be way too long sometimes. If we need to take a little break, stretch your legs, uh, use the bathroom, anything like that. I just go in my pants. I could pee. Okay. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, I can't think what they were called. Clap. Yeah. Hold on. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, well, Tony, is there any of those left? No big deal. There's a bunch left. I'm Careful. I, I, you know. <laughs> Why? Yeah. Give us a clap. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Dude. Yeah, you like that? You yeah, like I that? like it. You're going to hear that at like 45 minutes and 20 seconds. You're going to hear like a badger rustling through your garbage in the background. I, I'm like, <laughs> I knew badger were doing it. I was like, the hell in twin underneath the desk, and I could hear it clear as day. <laughs> <laughs> what are you trying to say, Todd? Yeah, I don't know. What you're doing I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, that was brought to you by Todd. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thanks, Todd. Yeah. Uh, oh, there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love the clap. Uh, you know, at one point, in his his setup in there is freaking nice. He's got a recording What's studio in there and stuff. Um, you asked me too fast. I can't remember. What's it it's wrong. Ro- yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guys. Ain't... Oh, well. Okay. That's now crazy. that we've talked about the state of the music industry. All right. We're so going to do it again. I hope, hope you recorded all that. <laughs> <laughs> all right. <laughs> That's a buck set. <laughs> <Jeez. laughs> Whoa. <laughs> and away we go. Well, that's it for these knobs please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. Visit our website at theguitarknobs.com for all of our past episodes, four on the floor blog, and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also be sure to check out our Instagram at guitar knobs. Catch you next time.